everybody you're about to see it at Shior, unlike anything else you've ever seen and i know you may have heard this before but i promise you no one's going to talk about slavery the way you're about to hear the truth about slavery the fact that it's actually good under certain conditions even more so young marriages uh the according to the torah three years old six years old seven years old is it true that it's good that it's bad controversial teachings in the torah a lot of stuff that the missionaries the anti-torah Farrakhan type of people say are some of the things true is it all a lie you're gonna hear a lot of interesting things that uh, are going to straighten out your brain and make you realize that there's nothing greater than the divine Torah there's nothing holier than the divine Torah and in fact you've been missing out all along but not anymore enjoy support and make sure to share We are uh, back here on a Wednesday night, stumped the rabbi, we're after some divrei Torah. You guys, Bezat Hashem, will ask some questions, and uh, Bezat Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch will give us the answers. Tonight's shiur will be for the uh, refuah shlema for Rabbanit Sarah, Bat Anat, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Levana, Bat Sarah, Avi Mori David Ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jorah, and also for all of Am Israel and all the righteous Noahides out there that continue to watch the Shurim with us, growing spiritually, growing closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, doing good things, and uh, continue to support our organization, all the wonderful things that we're doing, Baruch Hashem. So tonight, we have uh, quite, a, quite a bit of information, quite a bit uh, to go over uh, in uh, Parashat Mishpatim, uh, is our weekly Torah portion, where uh, after Matan Torah, we uh the first thing uh, that uh, you would think after we receive the torah perhaps the uh narrated part of the story will continue maybe we will go over into other stories how did people react but no what hashem decided to uh put in the torah right after we received the torah at you know last week's uh, parashat itro mount sinai the climatic event of uh, of the world and its existence as the gemara in masechet shabbat says that uh, on uh, Friday, uh, Hashem made a, uh, a covenant, if you will, uh, with the, uh, you know, with the um, heaven and the earth, that uh, one day when he gives the Torah to Am Israel, if they accept it, then the uh, world will continue to exist and Am Israel will become the, uh, the Jewish nation. Uh, there will be a light to the nations, there will be a holy nation, a nation of priests. But if they don't accept the Shabbat, then they will die right there and then. And that's why the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that uh, when uh, we um, got to Mount Sinai, if you pay attention to the verses in last week's parasha, it says that Am Yisrael wasn't at Mount Sinai, but rather under Mount Sinai, meaning that Hashem picked up the mountain over the uh, heads of all of Am Yisrael and uh, told them that if you accept the Torah, you can uh, view this as if this is our chupa. Anyone that has been to a Jewish wedding knows that there is a little canopy covering the bride and groom uh, as part of our tradition. And Hashem says that uh, if you accept the Torah, then this is like our marriage. You become my chosen people. But if not, this will be your burial ground because I'll drop the mountain right on top of you. And that's the covenant that he actually made with, the, uh, with his creation on the sixth day. Uh, says the Gemara that uh, that's the reason why the, uh, on the uh, first day of creation, it says that it was evening, it was morning, uh, first day. Second day, it was evening, it was morning, second day. The same thing with the third day and the fourth day and the fifth day. The, the names Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all those names, those are all uh, names that were uh, created by uh, uh, different idol worshippers later on. This has nothing to do with the Torah. According to the Torah, the days of the week are, called, are based on numbers and, rele and uh, relevance to the Shabbat, as the Shabbat is the foundation of the world. But yet when we get to the sixth day, we see that uh, it says that it was evening, it was morning, the sixth day. The, meaning there's an extra a word there. In Hebrew, it's an extra letter. Yom Hashishi. Why Hashishi? Why not Yom Shishi? 
And the, uh, the uh, sages explained to us in the Talmud that that extra hay has the numerical value of five, representing the five books of Moses, representing the covenant between Am Yisrael and their creator, that if they accept the five books of Moses, they accept the Torah, then they have the right to exist. They're going to be a light to the nations. They're going to be a nation of priests, a holy nation. But if not, then in essence, they lose their right to exist, and so does the world. Uh, and the world would have ended at that moment, and that's why the uh, Midrashim explained to us that uh, at Matan Torah, it wasn't just Am Yisrael being very nervous uh, and literally dying uh, and being resurrected after hearing the uh, God's voice, but also the entire creation was nervous. All of the angels were, were, uh, were nervous. Why? Because they knew about this covenant. They knew about this deal. They knew that if Am Yisrael does not accept the Torah, that is the end of the world. Uh, and Hashem, as the Zohar Kadosh says, Hashem created and destroyed six worlds before He created this final one. And uh, so it's not uh, difficult for Him uh, to destroy just another one. This is also answers the, uh, uh, the question of the heretics that say that God needs us. Obviously, if He needed us, He wouldn't threaten us. So the point being here is that uh, the uh, acceptance of the Torah was a monumental event, the climatic event of the world. And until Mashiach comes, this will remain the climatic event of the world. Uh, but yet, when a person uses their logic, they think that, oh, there are so many wonderful stories during the first two books of the Chumash, of the five books of Moses. And now we got to this part of the story of receiving the Torah. Perhaps the narration of the story will continue. But instead of getting a narration of the story, Parashat Mishpatim has practically no narration whatsoever, no story whatsoever, but rather it's an entire Torah segment talking about different rules. And in fact, when you look at these rules, you look at these laws, perhaps there are some of the most controversial laws in the Torah according to today's society's ideology. Uh, and uh, when you see, for example, that the Torah says, uh, you know, you shall not have mercy upon a pauper in a dispute. You know, the liberal mentality of today uh, is going to say, oh, look, you know, God is telling them, their Torah is telling them, because obviously they don't necessarily always agree that God gave us the Torah. They, uh, this religion is saying that you should be mean to, uh, to poor people. Why should you not have mercy on a, uh, on a poor person in a dispute? You should have. If one guy is rich and the other guy is poor, you should, and they have a fight between them, just give it to the poor guy. But the Torah says the exact opposite. You're not allowed to do such a thing. You're not allowed to have mercy on the pauper. So, of course, anyone that does not learn from a scholar of Torah and instead learns from anti-Semites and anti-God people that uh, claim to represent God, like the uh, uh, he, uh, black Hebrew Israelites or Louis Farrakhan or uh, the uh, Christian missionaries that now call themselves Messianic Jews, if you learn the Torah from such uh, evil people, then certainly you're going to arrive at the wrong conclusion and start thinking that you know more than God, you are more merciful than God, and perhaps this is not a book to listen to. So this particular segment that we're going to go into tonight is going to address, address some of these claims that are made by the people that hate the Jewish people and hate the Torah, and in fact, take different parts of the Holy Torah, and whether it be the oral Torah especially, or the uh, written Torah, and manipulate the words in whatever fashion that they want, in order to make you believe that this is a mistake, you shouldn't listen to it, and of course, the average person out there that sees some of the lectures that we have, uh, like the clips, that we published uh, recently on TikTok and other places saying that the halakha, the law, according to the Torah, for a man to waste seed is that it's equivalent to murder. That's what the Rambam paskins as the law. This is the same thing as what the Torah itself says. But uh, a person that is an atheist or is liberal or uh, you know or anything else will say, oh, look at that. They even want to manage my uh, private uh, moments with myself. This is uh, ridiculous, too much religion, too much control. This is obviously bad. Now, of course, anyone that knows the law and has watched the lectures that we've discussed this issue uh, sees that uh, the best thing you could ever do for yourself is to protect 
your seed and not waste it and needless to say follow the rest of the Torah but when it comes from either an ignorant teacher or a biased teacher a teacher that has an agenda such as the one that's uh, the agenda that's being taught in multiple volumes of uh, Louis Farrakhan's book the uh, secret relationship between the uh, Jews and the uh, blacks uh, which obviously has caused quite a bit of tension between the two communities uh, in in recent years especially this last couple of years uh, even though it's been published for many years already the reality is that when somebody like that teaches you the Torah then of course you're going to arrive at the other side you're going to agree with them you're gonna say wait a minute you're telling me that your Talmud tells you that uh, a three-year-old uh, girl can have sex with a uh, with an adult you're telling me that slavery is a good thing and slavery is something that the Torah supports you're telling me that uh, you know the uh, uh, these laws are things that you guys still hold by you're following the Talmud now of course we do follow the Talmud but not your interpretation of the Talmud and in fact one of the most important things that a person can do for themselves is to make sure that they listen to someone that actually knows what they're talking about not necessarily somebody that's just simply a good speaker and has a good vocal cords that uh, ensure that the listeners in the back of the uh, 50,000 people stadium can hear so of course one of the things that we see in this holy Torah in this week's parasha is one of my favorite verses in the Torah they're all beautiful they're all wonderful they're all music to my ears but of course there are always things that stand up they're always ones that you know you can uh, uh, really uh, see uh, yourself in it's midvar sheker tirchak the verse that says from a thing of lies stay away from stay away from anything of lies unlike all of the other sins in the Torah where Hashem says you're not allowed to do this and you're not allowed to do this and you're obligated to do that when it comes to lies Hashem says not only are you not allowed to lie but you have to stay away from lies stay away from liars and unfortunately when the vast majority of society is ignorant about the truth because their first time uh, and only time of hearing any aspects of the Torah is usually coming from the likes of the people that I mentioned then what ends up happening is that that becomes their version of the truth that becomes their truth that becomes their ideology if you will or better said that becomes their excuse to hate the Jewish people and hate the Torah and hate uh, everything that has to do with it even if they say they love God so it's time we address some of these things by simply looking at what the actual Torah says what does it really mean and in fact one of the things that I learned early on the first book that I ever got from my rabbi many years ago uh, that uh, for anyone that wants to learn the truth behind the Jewish ideology what you're supposed to have this is a wonderful book that was written about 70 years ago or 60 something years ago by Rav Avigdor Miller Aleva Shalom called Rejoice O Youth now this is a interestingly written type of book it's a, uh, a conversation between a rabbi and a uh, young man that is having trouble with his faith although he is learned uh, to a certain extent and uh, really all of the possible questions that you can come up with are listed in this book now I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to everybody unless they have some basic foundation of uh, of Torah but certainly if you have questions this has answers and one of the questions that you'll see on um, page 197 is the uh, young man is asking about why is it that uh, we're not uh, allowed to uh, teach Torah to the Gentiles specifically or perhaps better said why is it that the oral Torah that was also given to us on Mount Sinai remained oral Torah for many many centuries why didn't God just simply write everything and allow uh, everybody to have easy access to it now of course as a side note anyone that's familiar with the oral Torah knows that the oral Torah is not just a single book like the five books of Moses that can fit into your pocket if you really uh, you know have small enough uh, print uh, but rather the oral Torah is a uh, monumental 
uh, work that literally is comprised of millions of books millions of books with the basic foundation starting with the mishnah uh then of course you have the interpretation of the mishnah which is the gemara then of course after that you have all of the uh, uh laws that are in the gemara were also uh, uh you know put into the rambam the rosh and eventually the shulchan aruch all of the different rishonim the uh, early sages that took the laws from the Gemara, from the Talmud. Gemara and Talmud are uh, synonymous, and uh, they're, uh, they, they mean the same thing. It's just a, uh, uh, in the old days, it, it meant something different, meaning that initially it was a, uh, um, there was less than what we have, uh, what was the original plan. I'll get into that a little later. But point being is, is that this, holy talmud or gemara is not inventing anything new it's simply telling you what the mishnah is actually saying and uh the sa- showing you what the sages are debating not because they're they don't agree of what was said at mount sinai but rather they're showing you that they have asked every possible question about this particular law that is brought down in the oral Torah in order to show you that there every possible thing that you can ask every possible thing uh, that you can uh, uh, conjure up in your mind was considered and therefore uh, 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 if it's uh, if it wasn't chosen there's a reason of why it was chosen which is elaborated in the Gemara most importantly they're telling you how the final law the final conclusion was arrived at but of course the uh the the anti-semites the haters of judaism are not going to tell you that they themselves don't know that they simply just take one sentence out of the gemara and they uh, manipulate it interpret it in whatever way that they want and they don't even know about the later books the other uh uh, uh, teachings that uh, stem from the gemara such as the laws they also have no concept of what the other aspects of the oral Torah, such as the Zohar Kadosh, that was written even before the Gemara was uh, by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. But Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, unlike what people uh, uh, think, he didn't just invent the Zohar by himself. If you've ever read the Zohar, reviewed at least part of it, you will see that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai not only mentions statements made by other sages, uh, and not just his own, but is also quoting other books, uh, somewhere around 60 different books that preceded the Zohar and Kadosh, meaning that Kabbalah wasn't invented by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. That's also part of the what we received at Mount Sinai. And needless to say, all of these books are the basic foundation of the Oral Torah, but what, why did I say millions of books? Because as the generations continued to grow and pass and so on there was more and more elaboration that was necessary either in order to clarify something or in order to apply it to something that didn't exist back then such as electricity cars uh you know different types of uh uh time frames that existed for the jewish people whether they were in a pogrom and an inquisition there were even uh unique laws that were passed at the time of the holocaust anyone that read some of the work of uh, rabbi ephraim oshri who was inside the holocaust inside the uh, uh the the nightmare uh but yet still writing torah there and explaining to people how to deal with difficult circumstances such as a woman that's pregnant uh and is about to deliver a baby what should she do uh and in fact uh you know when when the baby was delivered uh, you know there was a, a law that the uh uh, uh Shimam, the nazis had that you're not allowed to obviously practice any aspect of judaism whatsoever and if she would uh uh give a brit milah a uh, circumcision to our son certainly this meant death for her and the baby but yet he writes about this and the woman did do a brit milah and the she was killed along with the baby uh and of course there was a person that asked another very difficult question where his son was uh uh in line to go to one of the camps uh and since this man was a very rich man he was able to bribe one of the nazis uh and uh in essence uh get his son out the only problem is because the nazis were so precise 
with their calculations that would mean that they would take his son out but put somebody else's son in and he asked Rav Ephraim Oshri if this is allowed if he's allowed to rescue his son knowing well that somebody else's son is going to replace his son uh so th- this is obviously a, a life and death question but at the same token is your blood redder than somebody else's the point being is anyone that sees the psak halacha that was written at the time of the holocaust by rabbi ephraim oshri by some other chachamim that were there literally you would just you cannot imagine the level of wisdom that they had the sacrifice they made but also just the impossible situation that they had to deal with much much more extraordinary than the general public knows now of course this oral torah is something that is the foundation of the torah there's no such thing as written torah without the oral torah the uh the uh, there's no way to understand the written torah without the oral torah uh, simple examples that i've given in the past is for example the things that you see like in this week's parasha where it says that uh, if somebody damages another person is an eye for an eye an ear for an ear uh, and so on and so forth and of course the uh, the, the muslims and the uh uh it love to interpret this literally where if somebody hurts somebody else's eye then you have to punish him by removing his eye if he hurts somebody else's ear you remove his ear this obviously is foreign to us this has nothing to do with judaism we never remove anybody's eye even if he intentionally hurt somebody else's eye and caused him to lose vision but how would you know that from the verses you wouldn't you would only know that if you studied the Talmud and saw that this is referring to monetary value. He has to compensate him for damaging his eye. And of course, anytime that it talks about the, uh, the issues of, a, uh, uh, of, of slavery, if you look at slavery uh, and how it's perceived in the world today, many people refer to slavery usually using the, uh, uh, the main thing as the example of what happened to the blacks. Uh, over the last few hundred years uh, disregarding the fact that there are still slaves in the world today both ones that are doing it against their will and ones that are doing it uh, you know willingly but needless to say everyone views slavery as a horrible thing as something that is terrible as something that is uh, 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 against humanity and so on but the truth be told if you look at the verses in the Torah itself uh, you can see that slavery, according to the Torah, is not only something that God put into the world, and He doesn't put anything that's bad into the world. It's just that it's a different form of slavery. And if you don't learn the oral Torah, you're never going to understand how could there be good form of slavery. How could there be a good slavery, a bad slavery? But at the same token, you're saying that the the master can hit the person. Uh, so how could that be good that sounds like what happened to the black people at the same token you see that one of the rules are is that if the uh, slave master uh, hurts the slave and uh, he loses a tooth he has to free the slave the slave leaves other times you see that the actual person chooses to be a slave this is obviously foreign to people because people are not familiar with anybody in today's world or even in recent history choosing to be a slave uh so of course none of the black people chose to be slaves so how could this be the same type of slavery these are some of the things that you obviously are unaware of unless you study the torah with a torah scholar that knows what he's talking about and knows how to explain things and again this is not my interpretation versus somebody else's interpretation this is what it's always been since the beginning thousands of years ago it's still the same now unfortunately the vast majority of society is uh ignorant to it and even the ones that are familiar with it still choose to ignore the truth and spread their lies because they have an agenda to push so of course we're going to try to deal with some of these things one of the other things i would say also is that we see that there are 12 times in the torah where hashem says that a jew not only has to observe the shabbat but if he does not if he desecrates the shabbat willingly he gets a death penalty so needless to say this is a very big deal 
if if a jew desecrates the shabbat he gets a death penalty today we don't have death penalties because we don't have the sanhedrin but that doesn't mean that people don't die because of their desecration of shabbat it's just that hashem has patience and he gives people opportunities to repent sometimes those opportunities could be literally decades of their life but eventually that person will be punished either in this world or the next or both the point being is is that since this is such a critical law in the foundation of the world the foundation of the jewish people there is no jewish people without the shabbat you would think that the written torah would give you the details of how do i keep the shabbat how do i observe it but you will never find the details of how to observe the Shabbat in the Rin Torah already telling you that obviously this creator didn't create you to kill you. If he's telling you observe this or I'll kill you, then obviously he is he gave you a manual of how to do it. You're never gonna find that manual in the Rin Torah. You will only find it in the oral Torah, which explains to you that there are 39 different things that were done in order to build the temple, to build the Bet Mikdash, to build the Mishkan. In the desert, that was the original temple. Then you had the first Bet HaMikdash in Yerushalayim. It was destroyed after 410 years. And then the second Bet HaMikdash was built 70 years later. That lasted 420 years. And then it was destroyed. But needless to say, the same exact process was done in order to build the Bet HaMikdash. 39 different things. Whether it was a, uh, a hammering something, destroying something, winnowing, and so on and so forth. And our sages teach us, those very same 39 things that you did in order to build god's house in this world are the very same things you're forbidden from doing on the shabbat so from here we see that shabbat is so holy that you're not even allowed to build god's house in this world on it but again you will never find this in the written torah but if god loves us and god created us and tells us 12 times not once not twice and not even 10 times 12 times that if we don't observe the shabbat we'll get a death penalty obviously he has to give us instructions of how to keep it do we keep it in the box do we keep it on a calendar what do we do with it so those instructions are indeed given and there are many different laws pertaining to shabbat that stem from those 39 explaining those 39 how do you actually apply those 39 what do they apply to because of course you know it's a uh, writing is not necessarily just writing with a pen writing can be done in multiple ways including your makeup uh and they uh you know whether the other melachot all stem into other things that are applicable today this is the reason why the sages throughout the generations wrote other books that weren't passing any new laws but rather letting you know how to apply those pre-existing laws that we had a mount sinai that we got a mount sinai that were practiced uh without fail how do we apply them in the new world that we live in with new technology with new uh, uh society mentality ideology and so on without discounting even a hair's breadth from it so here we see that the oral torah is very much a critical part of the torah and that's why in the torah multiple times it says torahs meaning torah but plural why torahs if we only receive the five books of moses because again the uh, torah is both the written torah and the oral torah now when you see the uh the typical uh speech by louis farrakhan typically you'll see him letting his uh congregants or what i like to call victims uh, uh rebuked in such a fashion where he simply tells them that they're all sinners they're all not good enough they're all uh uh doing things that are not exactly uh, uh good for society but it's not their fault it's not their fault because it's the fault of hollywood it's the fault of society that uh in essence breeded them and trained them to become what they are he doesn't obviously apply this to the successful among them whether it be the the ones that are on the billionaire list or the ones that are on the millionaire list or even the ones that just are average regular wonderful people that uh, have succeeded he simply says that anyone that is doing bad it's just because of somebody else's fault which in essence turns his entire community into victims not victims of him beating them up physically but beating them up spiritually by simply telling them that they have a disease that's incurable because it's somebody else's fault and there's no medicine for it 
Now, of course, the teachings of the Messianic Jews, which are also Christians with a new name, are not very much different. They simply take different verses from the Talmud and manipulate them in their own way by simply taking it as this is what it is, a face value, where it talks about a three-year-old that uh, had a uh, 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 sexual uh, uh, relationship with a man. They don't talk about the fact that it was against her will. They don't talk about the fact that the sages speak against this. They're not, they're simply stating it as if, oh, a three-year-old had sex with a big guy. Oh, so see, the, the, the Jewish sages promote pedophilia. Of course, this again has to be uh, 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 taught in a specific way uh, because if you look at it from that perspective, it looks horrible. Uh, whether it's today's society or the previous generation's society, if you look at it at face value. But when you look at it from the actual, what the teaching says before and after that one sentence, then you can see that this is a world of difference between what they say and what the truth is. And of course, the black Hebrew Israelites and the other uh, idiots among them are uh, so ignorant, it's hard to even debate which one of their stupidities is worse than the other because they are just so clueless they don't even realize what they don't know the others actually know parts of the truth they just like to manipulate these black hebrew israelites they simply don't even know the difference between truth and falsehood because they just simply go with it like this one guy that made a video against me calls himself the uh, hebrew yeshua or some nonsense like that and uh, he says that the talmud and uh, Perke de Rabbi Eliezer says that uh, God uh, punished the uh, 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 Noach's uh, or, or, or gifted uh, Noach. Well, hold on a second. Perke de Rabbi Eliezer is not part of the Talmud. But he wouldn't know this, and neither would any of his people. The Talmud was written about 16, 1700 years ago. Perke de Rabbi Eliezer was only published 500 years ago. Now, even though Rabbi Eliezer ben Holkinus was certainly one of the sages that's countly, that's mentioned countless times in the Talmud, but that particular, those teachings, that book, was not published at the time of the Talmud, was not something that uh, it became part of the Talmud. These are just separate teachings that he had that are not part of the Talmud, just like the Sifra and the Sifri and the Zohar and other books that and other teachings that other sages uh, brought into the world, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, they also had other teachings that were not part of the Talmud. But if you tell this to a black Hebrew Israelite, they won't even know what hit them because they literally do not know the difference between right and wrong. So they'll simply say, oh yeah, the Talmud says such and such. They don't even know what the Talmud is. Or you have this other moron that says, oh, I'm a, uh, I'm a, Talmud, uh, I'm a Talmud scholar. I'm a Talmud scholar. And he says, I have the Talmud right here. And he holds a book, like, uh, I don't know, some blue book that apparently is like the idiot's guide for Talmud or something that was made by some Christian. And he actually thinks that the Talmud is a single book. Now, of course, anyone that has even seen, forget about study the Talmud. You just saw the Talmud. You see that this is as far from reality as possible. Why? You have between the Talmud Yerushalmi and the Talmud Bavli, you have 60 tractates 60 so in, in in if you let's say you have you're using let's say the arch crawl english edition of it which has both the aramaic and interpret you know uh, translated to english you have uh, something like a uh, i don't know maybe 130 books so how did you take all 130 books and fit them up in a little 500 page little book that you bought at uh, bars and nobles how did you do that exactly so of course if you tell this to him, he won't even know what you're talking about because he actually believes he's a Talmud scholar. So again, these are the things that are bothering a lot of people. Uh, they're bothering a lot of people because unfortunately the vast majority of society today is ignorant about what the truth is. And we're going to try to cover it. There's a lot of things we can cover. Literally, I can do this speech for a hundred hours straight if Hashem gives me the strength, but I know that you guys have a lot of questions. So, Bezat Hashem, we're going to try to cover certain things that are mentioned in society today. And one of them is the fact that the Torah starts in this parasha, it says, Ve'le'a mishpatim asher tasim lifnehem. These are the laws that you shall place before them. God is telling 
Moses, these are the laws you shall place before them. Now, obviously, everyone knows that Moses didn't write the, uh, the, the, the book right there and then. So what is he putting in front of them? So you're going to say, oh, yeah, well, he's just teaching it to them. So why doesn't it say these are the laws you'll teach them? Why does it say you'll place before them? To seem. To seem is, 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 is doing something. It's not just teaching. Because other times of the Torah, it uses the word teach. So why, what's to seem? A holy sages say tasim lifneim is in essence teaching moses and thereby us that it is a special mitzvah to teach to torah in a easy to understand format not only to teach the torah from your scholarly perspective but teach the torah from the average person's perspective so they can understand it because if I teach the Torah the way that we learn it, nine out of ten people, if not ten out of ten people, are simply not going to understand. Not because they're dumb, chas v'shalom, but rather because you need to have some basic foundation in order to build upon. And when a person doesn't have that basic foundation, then obviously you can tell them whatever you want to tell them, but they won't understand. Similar to if a person went into uh, NASA and or uh, went into a uh, 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 one of these uh, companies that is building rockets and they told him, okay so uh, we want you to uh, make sure that the uh, aerodynamics of the rocket are exactly uh, as stated in the file over here these are the coordinates these are the details these are this and the guy took a English class major in uh, college that's his degree and he has no idea what they're talking about. What coordinates? What, 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 what are you talking about building? Now, what do you mean? We want you to build a rocket. Here you go. Don't you know calculus? Don't you know statistics? Don't you know all of the different prerequisite courses that are required in order for you to even understand rocket science? No. Oh, oh then obviously you're not right for the job. I guess we should have asked you that during the job interview. Now, that doesn't make that person stupid. He may be the biggest scholar in the world in a subject that he did study. But if he doesn't have the prerequisite for, of rocket science knowledge, then it's simply not the right fit. You can't build upon it. So if you want to take the, uh, the job of teaching him rocket science, teaching him calculus, teaching him statistics, teaching him all of these different things, and obviously spending years doing it, then you can do that uh, but you'd have to do it from first step, second step, third step. You can't teach him as if he's already a scholar. Same concept is what is taught to us here in the first verse of the parasha. If you're going to teach the public Torah, especially when it's the general public, you have to teach them the public in a format that people will understand. Things that are not too difficult to understand, things that are not going to leave up too much to the imagination not necessarily spoon-fed them to the point where they uh, uh, it bores them to death and it's just too much details, but again, it needs to be understandable. And this is actually one of the uh, great things that you see about some of the great sages like Rav Ovadia, Yosef Alava Shalom, where the giant that he was and the uh, dozens of books that he uh, wrote, and anyone that's a scholar that has read his book sees that is literally... Uh, the, the level of genius that was, that, that's in them is simply second to none. But yet when he gave lectures, since he gave lectures to the general public, regular average people, blue collar people, he lowered himself to their language and spoke to them in their level. And little by little as they grew in Torah, he obviously also started teaching more and more complicated things, started teaching more and more elevated things. But needless to say, it's an important thing to do when you're teaching people. Not to uh, try to uh, uh, stand over them as if you know everything, they know nothing, and in essence, make them lose all hope. And uh, as I was saying earlier today, in regards to the oral Torah, and one of the reasons of why Hashem did not make the oral Torah in written format is, as I said, the first reason being that it simply would not fit in a single book or even in 10 books. You literally would have millions of books. So this is obviously not something that is a uh, possible. Uh, and the second thing is, 
although we have those books today and they're continuing to be written and interpreted and so on but again at mount sinai it's a uh it wasn't uh the generation was higher uh level spiritually and intellectually they were able to retain this without having it to be uh in written format and the second reason is as Rav Vigdo miller says is because hashem did not want to make the oral torah easily accessible by the gentile nations lest they defile the torah and this is what he says the young man asks is the uh is this the sole reason of making the oral torah less accessible to the nations of the world and how Victor miller says another reason why the oral torah was concealed was to prevent the nations from defiling it how would they defile the torah he says before the scriptures fell into the hands of the nations they were regarded with unblemished reverence but the nations when they began to use our scriptures committed upon them sacrilege after sacrilege first they used them through ignorance and through distortion to corroborate their errors meaning that just like the messianic jews hebrew israelites and other manipulators out there today are still doing they simply since they don't understand and they don't know how to learn these texts they simply just interpret it according to their own uh knowledge their own understanding and their agenda of either making themselves uh uh you know uh highlight their uh their jesus idol or uh their uh their um uh muhammad uh, prophet that they believe he's a prophet uh or they want to make themselves feel like uh, oh the uh, uh black people are uh are divine or some other uh nonsensical teacher that are out there they are gonna they're learning it with that agenda in mind this is similar to somebody that you know you see you know he is uh uh in front of a uh um a target and all of the uh arrows are in the middle of the target he's like wow you are a sharpshooter he says no not at all well how did you get them all on the target he goes very easy i stick the uh the arrow in the wall or in the tree and then i draw the target around it and that's in essence what these people do they simply have a goal to find their jesus to find their muhammad to, to find their black power to find their racism to find their anti uh, atheism whatever they're looking to find that's their goal already and they're simply going to look for him instead of looking for the truth instead of learning the truth they're simply looking for something specific and whatever matches uh, whatever can be manipulated enough to match their description just like they've done with uh uh the uh, uh chapter 53 of uh isaiah the book of isaiah or uh, chapter 9 of daniel and so on so this is not a new thing this is something that's happened throughout all the generations and thus the scriptures were interpreted in the opposite of what was really intended and to reach to teach the doctrines which are really abhorred in the scriptures in addition they explained them in a manner which belittled them and belittle the forefathers and great men of our nation and which made our laws appear crude and harsh in their folly they invented a theory that these laws were made harsh for the purpose of being a yoke and a punishment for the wickedness of the jews and thus they prepared the way for their doctrine that they have received a new law which is more just and lenient as befits the more righteous nations quotations although professing to revere the scriptures they minimize their value in order to agonize their own writings thus the uh the muslims which he calls the mohammedians claim that we falsified our scriptures or the nazarenes which means the christians their words the uh, the constant theme is true it is written so and so in the scriptures but i say unto you otherwise thus their honoring the torah was for the purpose of breaking it down and the only real value they found in the scriptures was for quotations to corroborate their doctrines in addition the laws and teachings of the scripture have been employed by the nations as excuses and justifications for selfishness cruelty and deceit and as a result these laws and teachings acquired an unpleasant savor 
in the eyes of the world and the scriptures came into disfavor when men are tortured to death for the glory of god when helpless and lone old women were burned as witches when unnatural practices and pessimistic doctrines are preached from scriptural texts then these leave an unpleasant connotation the jew who knows the remarkably just laws of the torah has an entirely different feeling on the matter the hypocrisy greed and cruelty of the nations have robbed the scriptures of their original grace which they had among the jews the gentiles have so ridiculed the puritan shabbat and the prudery of sexual decency that now the world has learned to despise the beautiful holiness of the day of rest and the pure excellence of decent chastity with that uh, with that they profane lips had never learned to utter the sacred words so we see from here that this oral torah being oral and even written in a certain format that you can call even cryptic was done intentionally why because again anyone that actually does know how to learn torah clearly can identify what's true and what's false clearly can know that you cannot take certain things at face value and there lies the next point that uh, we have in this week's parasha where it says that if you buy a jewish servant if you buy a uh, jewish servant he shall work for six years and in the seventh he shall go out to freedom without charge he already in this week's parasha right after we got the torah we're already learning laws and the first law is about slavery if you buy a slave so now the blacks are going to come that are obviously not on the right side because there are certainly many black people that are wonderful people some of them are dear students of mine that i treat no different than i treat my own kids and view as my kids but the ones that are ignorant the ones that have an agenda the ones that have wicked leaders that have misled them are gonna say wait a minute you're telling me that the jewish torah is promoting buying slaves yes yes the jewish torah promotes buying slaves yes but it's not the slave that you think there's a hebrew slave and then there's a canaanite slave and there are certain conditions that the torah also have for these slaves well first and foremost we see that the slave here the hebrew slave is not supposed to be forever it can be but it's not supposed to be why because if this person had a lost his mind and decided to steal something and by the time he got caught he already spent the money now you have to pay the money back there's no ious you have to pay the money back so what do you do well if you don't have the money that you stole you stole hundred thousand dollars from mr reuven you now have to pay him back now if you don't have the hundred thousand dollars that you stole you become a slave and pay back that through your slavery further it says if he meaning this slave if he enters servitude by himself what does it mean if he enters servitude by himself if you read it from the perspective of the christians if you read it from the perspective of the ignorance say well somebody people are so crazy that they just decide to be slaves no by himself means when he's not married he's single he's a single guy same condition as before he didn't just get bored one day and decide to become a slave no it's just that by himself is referring to somebody that's not married if he entered by himself he shall go out by himself his master may not give him a canaanite slave woman from whom to father slaves if he's a husband of a jewish woman for whom the master is obligated to provide food then when he leaves his wife shall go out with him 
the master is no longer obligated to provide food for her and if his master shall give him a canaanite slave woman and she bears him sons and daughters the slave woman for our children shall belong to our master and he shall go out by himself already here you have a whole mouthful what's going on here somebody stole they don't have the money they spent it on drugs they spent it on whatever they spent it on they have to pay the money back to put them in jail is not going to help anybody why all you're going to simply do is what the americans do which is waste a bunch of money on people that are uh destroying their lives and society at large you're not protecting society by throwing this thief into a jail for five years because in reality he goes into jail for five years learns from other criminals that are much worse than him how to do bigger crimes he comes out a bigger criminal than he came in there's no rehabilitation in jail nobody rehabilitates in jail they become bigger criminals hence the reason why many of them go back to jail multiple times so the torah says no no there's no jail you stole you become a slave if you don't have the money to pay back now if you're a single guy you haven't gotten married that means that your master for those six years that has to abide by certain conditions if he only has one pillow you get that pillow if he only has steak for himself he gives you that steak meaning you're not in some horrible place getting beat up every day and woken up in the middle of the night just to torture you no 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 he has to when the 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 uh, uh talmud teaches us that someone bought themselves a slave they bought themselves a master why because you have to treat this person better than you treat yourself because the whole point of slavery is to rehabilitate this person to improve him to teach him how to behave and how not to resort to stealing and doing other types of crimes and in fact you protect this person so if he came in as a single guy you don't give him some canaanite woman that is going to produce babies why because if he didn't get married then you don't give anybody to him he comes by himself he leaves by himself you don't use people as baby factories and in fact if he is married of course he can't just leave his wife and she's crying at home for six years no no she comes with him yeah but what's he gonna do what do you mean what's he gonna do the master has to feed the family what do you mean but she he stole money from him why would the master have to pay for it ah that's because slavery according to the law is very different than what people think is slavery the wife comes with them but the wife has to be fed she has to get everything that she would get if her husband wasn't a slave he's obligated and when he leaves he leaves with the wife meaning that the master doesn't have to feed her anymore why because the rehabilitation is done so here first and foremost before we get to the second part we see that slavery actually can be good very good for society and for the people themselves if it follows the laws of the Torah because since first and foremost it has an end it's not supposed to be in perpetuity it's not supposed to be forever second of all there's a certain type of treatment that is required you can't just beat up people and torture them and so on third you have to obviously give them a uh, food if they have a family feed them as well just because they made a crime doesn't mean that their family has to suffer and in fact it's an extraordinary rehabilitation opportunity for people that have become degenerates something that's very common in today's world where people resort to dealing drugs and prostitution and all types of uh, uh degenerate type of behavior and what does society do with them today in most of the parts of the world especially here in america oh you're a degenerate you sell drugs you stole you this you that okay we'll throw you in jail for five ten twenty years turn you into a bigger criminal than you already were eliminate any possibilities of you ever getting a job because no one would hire you unless they themselves are a former criminal or an existing criminal and in fact leaving your whole life behind in such a fashion that it becomes a distant memory but you have to relive it every day well the distant memory you made the crime 
but you have to relive the crime every single day for the rest of your life because the consequences don't end in jail when you come out can't get normal jobs and so on so here the holy torah tells us he comes you're going to buy him as a slave that's because you're a righteous person following the torah law to buy this person and not and 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 give him an opportunity over six years to pay you back and even more so feed him clothe him do everything that's necessary for him if he has a family give him that too treat him in a certain way get him off drugs get him off the street get him off of his degenerate behavior teach him how to be a righteous person in essence you are turning him into a student And if the people of today had an opportunity like this where they could leave their degenerate life their laziness their blameless mentality where nothing is their fault everything is their everybody else's fault this could actually turn a lot of people into very very productive people now of course this is all words in the air because society is not going to listen to what I'm saying but the point being is is to at least at the very least understand that there's nothing bad in the Torah if the creator of the world said it that means it's good if you don't know it that means you haven't learned it enough but it's certainly good so here we see that slavery is very different and in fact the Gemara in Masechet Makot, in the beginning of the Gemara, page 2b, says that there's not everybody becomes a slave just because they did something wrong. So, for example, there is a uh, false witness. One of the uh, laws of the Torah is that if somebody is a false witness and they get caught, whatever punishment and damage they would have brought onto the person they were false witness against they get themselves so the Gemara gives an example what if somebody was uh accused of stealing money and the two witnesses that came were really false witnesses he didn't steal any money but they said he stole money and then two new witnesses came and said no no it's completely a lie what these witnesses are saying a lie how do we know it's a lie because the day that they said they saw him steal they were with us at a completely different city which means it was impossible for them to be at that place at that moment the dayan the, the, the jewish judge says declares these two people as what's called zomimim false witnesses and they get punished now if this guy would have been the gemara says if this guy would have gotten uh, found guilty he could have turned into a slave so do we turn them into slaves too Kamala says no it's not right it's not justice why would it not be justice you just said they get the same punishment says no 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 the punishment that he would have gotten is to return the double the money that he stole if he stole a hundred he has to return 200 that's the punishment if he doesn't have the 200 then he becomes a slave because that's a form of paying the debt but if these two witnesses that are false witnesses have the money to pay back they just pay the money they don't have to become slaves so we see here that it's not there's there's a clarification to every single detail we're not just throwing people under the bus to say oh listen you this it's not some archaic law uh and uh, with 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 dragon slayers every detail has details every law has an endless amount of teachings in it hence the reason that when you hear certain uh, uh, people speak about it and just literally covering on the surface you just laugh to yourself and you realize wow these people not only do the listeners have no clue that they're being lied to and manipulated but the speaker himself doesn't realize how much damage he's causing and how far he is from the actual truth so already we see that there is a extraordinary benefit to slavery if it's in accordance to the Torah but then you're going to say wait a minute but what about the Canaanite slaves here or over here you're making him into a baby machine where if he's a Jew and he's uh uh the 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 master 
and he was already married so the master can give him some uh, Canaanite woman and he can produce babies with her and those babies become slaves for the master so he's just in essence a baby machine is that right yes it's right why is it right because when you think of history you cannot simply think of your life as being history your 20 30 40 50 years 100 years that you lived in the world is not history the world has been around for a long time the torah was given to us 3334 years ago the world was created in the Rishon 5784 years ago and throughout all of that time and until recent decades slavery was an accepted type of behavior there were certain people that became slaves because they didn't have the ability to do other things now you would say oh but that's not fair life is not fair you have some people today that can work for 10 hours and make minimum wage which i think in america now is 15 dollars an hour so they worked 10 hours and made 150 dollars now that's not necessarily a bad thing because if you compare it to other countries that 150 dollars is what people make an entire month so does that mean that the average joe today that makes minimum wage is really being unfair to the people in india in in mongolia in china no it's just that's acceptable here and that's acceptable there but yet also at the same token you have in the very same country that you have the same guy that makes 15 dollars an hour and makes 150 dollars a day guess what that guy works for another guy and his boss doesn't make 15 dollars an hour he may make 50 dollars an hour and his boss may make a hundred dollars an hour and guess what the ceo could be like what i was when i was a ceo on wall street making thirty six hundred dollars per hour just for existing now that doesn't mean that i woke up with a silver spoon in my mouth and i simply somebody decided to just pay me thirty six hundred dollars i obviously built a business that was worth millions and millions of dollars after being very poor after literally living off of a dollar per day for an extended period of time having coffee and a donut as my food for the entire day and only once in a blue moon actually have a piece of meat and i paid my dues and eventually god allowed me to succeed and eventually got to where it got to now other people had the same opportunity as i did some chose to do the same thing and succeeded as well some as much some less and so on and guess what some did not the majority did it does that mean that the guy at the top that makes three thousand dollars an hour is wrong and the guy at the bottom is right no does that mean that the people on the billionaires list are wrong for being billionaires no they did something for it they weren't just born that way and even if they were whoever gave it to them did something for it so stop crying victim because of your situation and use that time and energy to do something about it but when it comes to slavery slavery is still in the world today in different parts of the world including America some are actual slaves no different than in the past they're just obviously it's not as apparent to most people some are not even uh you know blue collar jobs where they are overworked and underpaid but don't really have many choices either because they don't have papers for 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 visas and green cards or because they're former criminals or existing criminals or many many other reasons the point being is is that slavery has been very much a part of society throughout all of the generations and a person that is in that position has certain choices and certain available to them that does not make the owner wrong by default now of course if the owner mistreats that person and goes against the law kills them rapes them and does all the other things those actions are wrong but to simply say that slavery is wrong and it's it's not necessarily true because we already see that there are certain ways that slavery could actually be good now of course i'm sure there's going to be some people hanging me on this and just manipulating the words that i'm saying but again if you learn 
what society has done throughout all of the generations you will see that slavery was something that people capitalized on in practically every country and in fact by every color while farrakhan likes to write in his book all about the different slave masters that owned the ships and owned the uh the uh the different places and the slaves that were jewish people why doesn't he tell his people that many people that owned slaves were also black people black people owned black slaves and yes there were some jewish people that owned black slaves and there were also some american people that owned black slaves and guess what there are plenty of people that own chinese slaves and japanese slaves and american slaves and arab slaves and all types of slaves even today stop picking on the jews for doing the same thing you did and everybody else did you see anti-semitism is not when you just simply say oh uh i disagree with the jews okay that's not anti-semitism oh i don't like that they did such and such evil they beat up somebody they stole somebody they did the, okay you don't like somebody's actions that's not anti-semitism zionism has nothing to do with judaism and although farrakhan and the likes always say oh zionism they're bad they're terrible and so on what they don't realize is that jewish people that are actually really jewish and observant to the law also agree that zionists are terrible and terrible why because they did a lot more harm to us than they did to anybody else in the world do you know that after the holocaust when many victims of the holocaust came to israel these very same zionists that were anti-torah anti-god atheist communists took jewish babies from yemen and morocco and sold them to americans sometimes as an adoption deal for people that couldn't have children only to find out that their real parents are somebody completely different decades later and they're still being discovered to this day and some for medical experiments they sold jewish children for medical experiments literally not bad not as not uh, worse than the nazis they're in the same level as the nazis so don't define judaism by the evil acts of the zionists just like we are not supposed to define the black people by the evil acts of the drug lords and the drug dealers and the gangsters and the losers of your society why because again they don't make up all of the black people just like all of these losers in zionism that are anti torah don't make up all of the jewish people and needless to say those people that you mention in your books that owned slaves and manipulated things and went against god and so on guess what they were not following this law you're not going to find one of the great sages of the torah going against the torah going against humanity you're not going to find that why because our torah tells us that we actually have to be even more careful in the way we treat the gentiles than even the way we treat each other when it comes to lending money and charging interest we're not allowed to charge interest as it says in this week's parasha to from one jew to another now although there are certain leniencies to allow to charge interest to a gentile a jew to a gentile this does not give us any permission whatsoever to charge whatever we want and have predatory rates like they have in the cash advance merchant cash advance business and the likes now you're gonna say yeah but there's a lot of jewish people in the merchant cash advance business you're right and they're all wrong for being in it and they're all gonna go to ganom for it yeah but they're religious no 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 just because somebody wears a certain outfit has a beard that grows by itself and even a hat to match does not make them religious what makes a person religious is if they follow the laws of the torah judaism is not a color that's why there are black jews there are chinese jews there are indian jews there are uh jews from tripoli like myself there are jews from all types judaism is not a color it's not a race and it's also not a certain type of clothing 
And just because somebody looks Jewish doesn't make them observant of the law. And guess what? Anyone that is overcharging and literally in a business that is taking advantage of society, needless to say, taking advantage of the Gentiles, is actually going to get punished more than anybody else in society. Why? Because this leads to the worst sin in the Torah called Chilul Hashem, desecrating the name of God, which the Gemara says, in Masechet Sanhedrin, Masechet Shabbat, in Masechet Abu Dazara, across all spectrums of the Talmud, desecrating God's name, there is nothing that you can do to fix it until death. There's no way to fix it until death. Because the punishment is so severe. Other things you can repent for. There's no repentance for Chilul Hashem. And while lending money with predatory rates to another Jew is horrible. Stealing from another Jew, terrible. Beating up another Jew, horrible. But taking advantage of the Gentiles, that's not just horrible. That's desecrating God's name. And there is no kapara. And that's also from the Torah. So you see, before you define what Jews are, First, you have to know what a Jew is. And not just define them by their clothes. Just like I can't walk into any neighborhood and simply decide that the guy that wears the hoodie is automatically a gangster. He may end up being a restaurant owner. And the guy that wears a, I don't know, big watch and big diamonds on his neck, they're all fake. They may end up being real. Or the guy that has two girls around his arms is a adulterer or a pimp. They may be his daughters. You can't just stereotype people and just simply assume what you think. You have to ask questions. And I think the injustice that's being done to the Jews is even less than the injustice that's being done to society at large that believes these lies. That simply miscategorize and mislabel Jews without even knowing what they really are. A holy Torah tells us that yes, slavery has been very much a part of society. God allows it if it's in accordance to the Torah. And that's why he says later on that if somebody becomes a slave but his master hurts him, He loses a tooth because of him. He loses an eye. Immediately, that person is freed. Even if he's supposed to serve a six-year rehabilitation sentence, if you will. He's freed that minute. Why? Did you ever hear of a black person being freed from their slavery? No. Did you ever hear of a black person getting any type of payment for getting hurt no why because the slavery of society that's not following the torah is a world away from the slavery that's mentioned in our holy torah in fact some of the other things that i mentioned is that if the master the jew that owns a canaanite slave gets upset at the Canaanite and kills him. Guess what? That Jew is charged as a murderer and a death penalty. Do you think any of those Irish, Italian, American, German, and even Jewish or black owners of slaves that killed some of their slaves ever got charged with murder or anything? No. Why? Because it's a different form of slavery. The slavery of 400 years ago and even the slavery of today is not a rehabilitation. It's a destruction of humanity. No different than the slavery of the Egyptians. Of how they had the Jewish people as their slaves. When we were there for 210 years. Of which 116 of those 210 years we were slaves much worse 
than any other nation after us or before us. So the Torah takes all of that into account. And in fact, the very same Torah talks about other things. If there is a fight between two Jews, if one guy kills the other, it's a death penalty. But what if he kills somebody else? It's an accident. Fight between two guys, and one of the guys hits a woman by accident that was pregnant. She loses our baby. Torah says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand. And if you're a Muslim, you're going to say, oh yeah, so that guy killed a baby in our body. You kill him. No, you don't kill him. You don't kill him. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That just means monetary compensation. Now, if he would have killed the woman intentionally or the man, then certainly he gets the death penalty. Even if he didn't mean to kill the woman, but he meant to kill the man, he still gets the death penalty because he meant to kill. The point is that there are details to the details. And a person that looks at the Torah from a superficial standpoint will always arrive at the wrong conclusion. The Holy Torah also talks about different restitution that a person has to pay if they do certain things. And if somebody steals and they admit that they stole, they simply have to return what they stole. But if they steal and they get caught, then their punishment is that they have to pay double. From here we see that there are two forms of restitution here. One is paying back what you stole. One is a fine. And the Gemara in Masechet Makot says that there, not everything has a fine. And sometimes... There's no payment back of something, but there is only a fine. When someone steals 100, if he simply returns it, admits that he made the mistake, returns the money, the crime is over. The end. But if he lied about it and claimed he didn't steal it and then he gets caught that he did steal it, then he not only has to pay back what he stole, but he gets fined. The amount that he stole. Similar to people that are false witnesses. People that are false witnesses get a fine. Because they didn't actually cause the damage. Because if they're caught as false witnesses, it's before the sentence, whether it be a death sentence or any type of monetary restitution, it's before the sentence was actually done. If their crime would have caused somebody else to get a death sentence, let's say they said somebody's an idol worshiper, and if they're really false witnesses, the death sentence that the person would have gotten, they get a death sentence. If they say that somebody's an adulterer, this woman that's married to this guy went with this guy. Torah says it's death penalty to both of them. To the guy that she was with, she cheated with, and her. But if she's the daughter of a Kohen, she gets even worse punishment because not only did she commit adultery, but she also desecrated the holiness of the Kohen. So it's a worse death penalty. But if there are false witnesses, and in reality they didn't cheat, there was no adultery, the which punishment do the Zomimim, these false witnesses, get? They get the punishment of what the man would have gotten, not the woman. They don't get the worst punishment. They still get a death penalty, but it's not the worst death penalty. The point being here is, is that we see that the Torah is as precise as humanly possible. It's divine. It's not a man-made book. But when people present it as if it's something that you could just 
delve into passively and understand it at face value, you're not understanding what you're reading. Torah also talks about if a man seduces a virgin, if she is engaged, both him and her get a death penalty. But if she's a single girl, and now he's with her, so long as she's willing, he's obligated to marry her. Why? Because now that she's no longer a virgin, the value the perception is that she's less he's not allowed to just simply seduce her and just go womanize to whoever he wants like people do in the world today people act like married couples even for just one night these days a woman is not a garbage pail she's not a might she's not a uh, bicycle but unfortunately some people today have been taught that you're too young to get married but not to act like you're married because if you tell them listen you know that in the old days and not even just a few thousand years ago 100 years ago 150 years ago my grandparents they got married when they were 12 years old in today's perception oh that's pedophilia that's this oh yeah you think that's pedophilia so how come you don't say to your daughter that has a boyfriend and she closes the door to her room you don't say that's pedophilia with our 15 year old boyfriend that sleeps over once in a while you see how hypocritical society is is that they don't mind at all that their kids that are 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 years old have boyfriends and girlfriends they don't mind that but if you tell them listen instead of them acting like boyfriend and girlfriend why don't you just get married the 12 13 14 years old oh no they're too young to get married what do you mean they're too young to get married they're acting like a husband and wife no no this is not good this is not good oh it's not good so you're telling me it's it's better that your daughter is just going to be used for as long as he decides to use her and then throw her into the garbage and he can use some other guy's daughter that's better that's a better form of society Oh, but you're too busy making fun of the Torah. It says, oh, yeah, but look, in the Torah it says that three-year-old girl was uh, with a man. Okay, so first let's address that. First and foremost, you should understand that the Gemara that talks about the three-year-old girl is not talking about any type of recommendation or permission to for a man to be with a three-year-old girl. This was a teaching that was referring to the body itself and how it recovers. Because the woman has a hymen. And if the sages teach that if that hymen is broken before the girl is three years old, it would actually heal and come back as if it was never broken. But if it's after three years old, it won't heal. But then it teaches further that they ask, the Gemara says, yeah, but what if it's a Shana Meuberet, a, what we call a, a year, a leap year, like we have a extra month. There's a certain years that we have 13 months instead of 12 months in the Hebrew calendar. And this was in those days, this was decided by the sages based on the renewal of the moon and the calculations and so on. So what if they decided that, oh, she's just about to turn three. This thing happened. She's about to turn three. Or she turned three. And this thing happened. Some guy did what he did. But then the sages made it a leap here. So in essence, she's no longer three years old anymore. She is almost three years old. The sages said... The power of the Torah will allow her body to heal. Meaning that the Holy Torah decides whether it heals or not. Not the body. Now you're going to say, okay, fine. 
What else you got? Again, we go back to society. Society today is deformed, disabled mentally, morally, and believes that a man and a woman should get married after they've used and abused themselves and others for many years. While the Torah tells us that you should be his first, she should be your first. You should be his only, he should be your only. And to protect people from their own evil inclination and to protect people from ending up putting themselves in difficult situations of lust and so on. All of society, not just the Jewish people, married much younger than today. And there were a couple of reasons for it. One was because the human body matured faster than it does today. One of the examples is we see that Rivka, Rivka in the five books of Moses, when Eliezer comes to look for a wife for his master's son, Avram sent him on a trip to go find a wife for Yitzhak, his son. Yitzhak is 37 years old. The sages teach us that Rivka according to some opinions, was as young as three years old. Some say she was six. Either way, she was young. Now, this is the five books of Moses. This is not Talmud. This is not uh, some... This is five books of Moses. Everybody, this is it. And she went with Eliezer, and she also brought her maidservant with her that took care of her. So you say, wait, so Holy Yitzchak, our forefather, married a three-year-old? Yes. Now, if you think that she was three years old, like you're three years old, then you don't know anything about Torah. Why? Because if you notice, if you give your three-year-old daughter a bucket, bucket, Tell her, fill it up with water. After you fill it up with water, bring it from there all the way to the backyard. As soon as that little three-year-old cute kid has some fun with the water, splashes everywhere, fills it up, tries to pick up the bucket, what do you hear? Daddy, it's too heavy. Can't pick it up. No, come on, you got to bring it to the backyard. And in fact, not just this one. I need you to bring 10 of them, 20 of them, 50 of them. What 50? I can't pick up one. And then the wife starts yelling at you, what are you doing? You're torturing our daughter. She can't pick up that bucket. You can barely pick up the bucket. It's full of water. Weighs like 30 pounds. What are you doing? Why? Because that's a normal kid today. But yet Rivka went to the well time and time again filled up a huge bucket to not only give water to Eliezer and his servants but to all of the camels that were with them we're talking about dozens of buckets of water now do you see any normal three-year-old in the world able to do that physically no obviously from there we understand that she was much more developed similar to an adult today or at the very least a teenager today than the three-year-old that you're familiar with. And guess what? You have to believe this. Not because of what I just said, but because of what I'm going to say from the Talmud. Because you see, despite what the anti-Semites like to say about Judaism, we all believe in Mashiach. And everyone knows Mashiach comes from the line of Judah. And David Melech. That's the line of Judah. And guess what? David and Melech had 18 wives. But the line of Judah that will eventually be Mashiach is not any of those 18 wives that you could just pick whatever you want. No, no. It's only one of them. Which one? 
the mother of Shlomo Amelech, the righteous tzedeket named Bat Sheva. Now our holy Talmud tells us Bat Sheva, how old was she? How old was Bat Sheva when she married David? You're going to think, oh, well, since she was technically married already to Uriah, and maybe uh, this, and maybe that, she's probably, I don't know, 15, 18, 12, 20. Throw some numbers out there. You'd be wrong. From the verses, the Gemara extrapolates and proves it cannot be anything else. Where it says, it is written with reference to Doeg and Achitofel, that they were men of bloodshed. Achitofel was the grandfather of Bacheva, for anyone who doesn't know. He was one of the arch enemies of David. Initially, he was his friend, his rabbi even. But he turned into a supporter of Avshalom. He says that Doeg and Achitofel both got cursed by David and lived half of their lives. A life is considered 70 years. So Doeg's life was 34 years. Achitofel's life was 33 years. But from there, we learn even further. We learn even further based on their ages and other things. It says, Achitofel, how many years did Achitofel live? 33 years. How do we calculate it? How old was Shlomo, King Solomon? How, how old was Achitofel when Shlomo was born? 10 subtract. When Achitofel, sorry, when, when Achitofel. So to calculate, okay, so how many years did Achitofel live? 33. To calculate how old he was when Shlomo was born, subtract seven years that correspond to Shlomo's age at Achitofel's death, meaning Shlomo was seven years old when Achitofel died, and then 26 years remain. This means that Achitofel had a great-grandson when he was 26 years old. So having shown that the uh, Achitofel had those three generations, meaning it was Achitofel, his uh, daughter, and she had a son, Shlomo. So deduct two more years for three pregnancies. And we find that the Achitofel, his uh, son Iliam, and his granddaughter uh, uh, Bacheva procreated at the age of eight, meaning she had Shlomo when she was eight. But Shlomo was from her second marriage, which means that Bacheva was six years old. When she got married at first. Now, if she had a baby already at eight, we see from here that the mother of Mashiach was, according to today's standards, a victim of pedophilia. According to a holy Torah, one of the holiest women that ever lived. If obviously, if this was pedophilia, if this was wrong, then God wouldn't make the Mashiach come from her. So from there we see that not only was the physical makeup of people, because an average eight-year-old or six-year-old cannot bring babies to the world, in today's world. But we see from the previous generations, 3,000 years ago, things were quite different. 
But even furthermore, the perception of people was different. Because parents were not interested in having their children waltz around having boyfriends and girlfriends, trying new things out. And in fact, we see the same type of thing across the board with different holy women and holy men in the Torah that got married in the single digits, six, eight years old, nine years old. So a whole section here in the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, page 69b, gives explanations and exact calculations based on the verses of the Torah, not just based on somebody conjured up this stuff. Meaning that if you actually look at the verses, you'll see that the age is actually stated in the Torah, not in plain sight where it says, oh, Bathsheba was six years old, David was, no, no. But if you simply do the math, you use your brain, say, oh, wait, he died when the son was seven. So that means that when he was born, he was 26. And you do the other calculation of the age of everybody else, you figure out, oh, she was that age. And the same thing with other people in the Torah. So from there we see that, number one, the people physically were different back then. That allowed them to procreate at a much younger age Number two, the perception of society regarding slavery, regarding marriage, regarding holiness, regarding truth and falsehood was also very different. Today, people think it's okay for people to do the things that married people do, but yet remain single until they're pretty much used property for an entire neighborhood. Today, people think that It's okay to take advantage of people and they call it hustling in order to get to the top. Today, people think that if you haven't succeeded due to the fact that you didn't have the same opportunities as other people that succeeded, therefore you are a victim. Today, the mentality is that we know more than our forefathers. Today the mentality is that those that speak the loudest with the most arrogance certainly might be most knowledgeable too. Today we think that if somebody is popular, he must be right. All of these things are false. If a person wants the truth, it's available to them on a silver platter. It's called our Holy Torah. And I can assure you, just as the sages teach us in the Pirkei Avot, sixth chapter, delve into it and delve into it because everything is in it. And everything that's in it is good. Because this holy Torah is the word of the one and only God of Israel. Both the written and the oral. And the fact that it doesn't agree with your mindset, your ideology, and the predisposition that you learned from Hollywood and your local neighborhood and a bunch of heretics, missionaries, and idol worshippers doesn't change the truth for what it is the truth will always be this is the reason why this week's parasha says midvar sheker tirchak from a thing of lies stay away from and in fact if that lie would even help the poor guy win a case against the rich guy Stay away from that too. Don't have mercy on the poor guy. 
if it's a lie just because that guy is rich doesn't make him wrong just because that guy is poor doesn't make him right the Torah is not bias because the Torah tells us that whatever you have God is the one that gave it to you and if you want to change your circumstances change your behavior and perhaps God will give you different options until then stop blaming God for your problems stop playing blaming the Jewish people and their Torah for your problems and stop categorizing the entire Jewish people based on the misbehaviors of a bunch of heretics that happen to be born Jewish just like you don't want us to categorize the entire Chinese black American German and all other nations based on the misbehaviors of a few and most importantly learn what a Jew is based on what the Torah says it is and not based on what you see from your eyes because sometimes the way we're children and sometimes the Jews are not the best representation of what Judaism is but you could certainly be sure that Hashem is not replacing us with anybody else he'll punish us unlike any other nation if you look at all of history the nation that has received the most amount of punishments has been the Jewish people pogroms inquisitions holocaust slavery blood libels generation after generation each time we distanced ourselves from the holy Torah God punished us we repented things improved we started assimilating and serving idols got punished again but yet we're still here and we're not going anywhere the difference is the Gentile nations Hashem lets them do whatever they want but when their cup is full of sins he doesn't punish them he annihilates them because they're not his chosen ones the Greeks the Romans the Spaniards the Egyptians the Assyrians the Babylonians the Nazis gone all they are are words in history books those of you that know that the lie is real will befriend the Jews befriend the Torah and serve the one and only God with no middleman no Jesus no Muhammad no nothing just the Torah and help the Jews get closer to Hashem help them be a light to the nations but if you want to fight them you may be allowed to win for some time because Hashem does use the Gentiles to beat up the Jews but eventually you're only going to lead to your own annihilation because the Jews are not going anywhere you may be allowed to give us some black eyes some scars but we're not going anywhere he chose us the only decision here is whether you want to be annihilated or you want to be among the righteous among the nations that also will see Mashiach go to heaven and have a wonderful eternity just the prophet says after the war of Gog and Magog two-thirds of the world will disintegrate to nothing because they're the enemies of God and his Jewish people but the third that remains Hashem will refine them like gold and silver to see which ones among them are righteous those that are will have eternity 
And guess what? The very same prophet says, those that are will go to every Jew that's a real Jew, that's a Torah observant Jew. And they will always find that Torah observant Jew wearing one of these tzitzit that has four corners, four of these strings. And these Gentiles will grab onto those tzitzit and say to that Jew, Our fathers lied to us. Please teach us. You can do that now. With that being said, I'll have a quick drink. And I'm sure you guys ask some questions. Okay, questions are coming from Facebook Live. Can you please explain <clears throat> the Sephardi custom of not eating milk and fish? <clears throat> There's nothing to explain uh, other than the, uh, it's not a custom, it's that there's some poskim uh, that are uh, more stringent in a uh, combination of milk and, uh, uh, and um, fish uh, and say that it is uh, forbidden to have milk and fish, but uh, the many, are, uh, many of the Sephardi poskim are more lenient and say that it's permitted. So it depends of whether somebody wants to be stringent upon themselves and uh, uh, eat milk and fish together or not. It's, according to the Torah, it's allowed. But there are some poskim that are more stringent and say that it, uh, the fish may look like meat, uh, it may not be healthy uh, to eat it together, uh, some health issues, so they are more stringent in regards to that because there is a Torah obligation to protect your health. And milk and uh, uh, fish uh, doesn't appear to be healthy. Uh, according to some sage, and I say that it's uh, to the, you know forbidden, and some say that it looks like meat, uh, so uh, it uh, could be confused, and therefore you're not allowed to eat it. But again, since it's already uh, prevalent among our Ashkenazi brothers, uh, the uh, you know there are some poskim among the uh, Sephardis that are very lenient in regards to this, and say there's no uh, problem with eating a uh, lox with cheese or whatever you want to eat, whatever fish you want to eat. That's kosher fish with uh, kosher cheese. There's no problem. So according to the Torah, it's allowed, and according to uh, many Safari poskim, it's also allowed. But if somebody wants to be more stringent on, upon themselves, yevoy le'em bracha, blessing will come upon them. Stringency is not a bad thing. Next, hi Rabbi. What is? Why is it that there is so much emphasis on fearing Hashem from Gehenom? Uh, well, the reason why is because fear is the number one motivation for why people make decisions in the world. That's how Hashem created us. Uh, psychologically speaking, uh, you know, I took some psychology classes when I was still uh, in school years ago. And uh, the number one motivator of why uh, everything uh, in the world operates is fear. You know, animals have certain instincts. Those instincts are fear-based. You know, they, uh, they, uh, they, they kill uh, in order to eat. Why do they kill in order to eat? It's not because they're necessarily hungry. Uh, they don't necessarily go and chase food because they're hungry. Uh, many times they go before they're hungry because of fear of dying. And needless to say, you know, humans... Uh, they uh, work certain jobs, live in certain neighborhoods, make certain friends, uh, get married, you know, do all the things that they do because they're afraid of not having it. They work because they're afraid of poverty. They eat certain foods because they're afraid of sickness. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, uh, contain themselves and not speeding on traffic bus because they're afraid of dying or an accident or, uh, or even getting a ticket from the police. Uh, you know, people behave a certain way and not the way that they necessarily want to be because they're afraid of being coming an outcast uh, and so on. So fear is uh, very much the number one motivation of why people do what they do. And this is the same thing that Hashem uh, tells us to do in accordance to serving Him. Uh, in Mount Sinai, Hashem scared the life out of us, uh, literally. Uh, and Moses said, he's testing you in, in order to make sure, and he's scaring you in order to make sure that you don't sin. Meaning that if uh, we know that there's going to be a consequence uh, that's very, very dear uh, to our sins, then we're simply going to think twice before we do it. Just like if somebody went into a restaurant, and that restaurant had all types of wonderful food on the, uh, on the menu without a price. So a stupid person would think, oh, if there's no price, it must be free. And he tells the guy, oh, listen, give me everything that's on the menu. Now the waiter says, sir, uh, do you realize that this is going to cost you $5,000? The 
There's five thousand dollars. What are you talking about? It's not five thousand dollars. Look, it's free. He goes, no, no, sir, sir. You have to turn around the menu, and you'll see the prices on the other side. And once he turns around the menu and he sees that the cheapest dish on the menu is five hundred dollars, all of a sudden he loses his appetite. Needless to say, he's not going to order everything. So once a person knows the price of something, it makes them make a more educated guess, uh, educated decision, I should say. Uh, so the same thing here. When a person knows that there is a very severe consequences for our sins, such as Geenom or Kafakela or Chibuta Kever or all of them, then that person is going to make uh, the uh, their decision process perhaps uh, a lot more uh, uh, in line with what the Torah says rather than what his desires uh, say. He may desire to be with this uh, woman that's somebody else's wife. Once he realized that if he does it, he's going to go to Geenom for a very long time and they're going to perform all types of surgeries on his male member without anesthesia. Uh, and they're going to hang him by that male member. And he's going to be tortured in, uh, in a uh, fire that's unlike any other fire that exists in this world. As there are multiple types of fires that are in Geenom that are unlike anything that exists in this world. Uh, as the Gemara tells us in Masechet Chayyah, uh, uh, so there is green fire, there's blue fire, there's red fire, there's a fire that uh, eats and drinks, there's a fire that drinks and eats, there's a fire that, uh, uh, you know, is a, uh, uh, the divine fire of, of uh, the Awanavi, all types of interesting fires, and all of those fires are going to be used uh, on this particular person at different times, and he's also going to go to a different genome of cold. Uh, so again, once a person knows that he's going to get punished, for a uh, inexplainable amount of time just for this five minute act if that much uh he's simply not if he's smart uh he's simply not going to do it he's not going to do it why because he knows it's not worth it that five minutes of pleasure is not worth five million years of, of punishment it's simply not so what if a person thought it's free he could do whatever he wants then he's going to be with everybody's wife so that's the thing. That's why it's, it's a critical for a person to know about the reward and punishment. Uh, next question, Michael's asking, there is a sophisticated vending machine that sharpens knives. The general public near me uses this service. Can a Jew have their knives uh, sharpened there? Or is it a concern of kashrut? Uh, I mean, generally speaking, the knives that are uh, sharpened are sharpened by uh, tools. Uh, they're not sharpened, uh, you know, they're sharpened by rocks or, or, or other types of uh, uh, thing. And the ones that are sharpened usually are uh, um, are clean. So I don't see there being a problem of you sharpening your uh, knife in this uh, thing. Certainly wash it, obviously, before you use it, but I don't see there being a problem as far as sharpening your knife there. Um... Hi, Rabbi, how should a person deal with a previous yeshiva student who fried out and is now superficially religious but curses and does bad things? What is the correct approach of Kiruv for such people? I have seen that if you tell them they will be punished, they will be turned off even more. Do you tell them that Hashem still loves you or do you teach Shirat Shemaim? Reshit Chochma Yirat Hashem. The reason... Uh, the Torah says the beginning of wisdom is fear of Hashem is because the reason why people sin is because they lack wisdom. They lack knowledge of the Torah. They lack uh, understanding of the consequence of their actions. And the, you know, the beginning of wisdom is teaching them about Yirat Shemaim. Now, you don't necessarily need to start with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the seven chambers of Geenom uh, on the first time you meet a person, but certainly you need to tell them that there is consequence for their actions. This is one of our 13 principles of faith. No matter what level of religiosity a person is, they have to believe that there are the 13 principles of faith. One of them is that Hashem rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. And needless to say, this is the same thing in society. In fact, one of the wise men among the nations once said that nature punishes ignorance with death. Uh, that uh, if a person is ignorant about his risks, then he could literally die because of that ignorance. He could take a pill uh, just because it looked uh, interesting, it looked like a cool color, not realizing that that pill could very well be poisonous to him. 
It may not be poisonous for somebody else, but it could be poisonous for him. He could be allergic to it or, or things like that. So him just choosing to take that pill because his friend took it and it looks cool, that ignorance could lead to his death. Him deciding to play with a, with a snake that he finds in his backyard because he saw some guy on, on television playing with snakes that he finds in their backyard. So he figures he could do the same thing. And that snake could actually be a venomous snake that kills him. Uh, so that ignorance uh, is, could lead to death. Same concept here. A person needs to know that their ignorance could lead to their punishment, their demise, uh, both in a physical world and the eternal world. And it's very important for a person to know that. Now, one of the things that I recommend for people to do that are not expert speakers and do not have all of the uh, basic foundation of Judaism on the tip of their tongue to answer people is don't do much speaking. Let us do it. Uh, and have these people watch lectures. If you want to do them a favor and, 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 and encourage them to watch the lectures, watch it with them. Invite them to your house or your office or wherever it is and say, listen, we're going to have a get-together, order some kosher pizza, have some guys over, and we're going to watch this video. You don't even have to tell them what kind of video. And then once they get there, you have a projector or a TV or whatever it is, and you put on one of our videos, or one of the films that we've made, either the one about my life, that's called Hashem Took Back His Millions, that's already uh, surpassed over 10 million views according uh, to the different channels and different languages, uh, or some of the other films that we've made. Those films have literally have transformed the lives of countless people, Jews, Gentiles, people that are formerly religious, existing religious, even rabbis have contacted me from the inspiration they got from that film. Uh, it's on our YouTube it's our channel, it's free, like everything else we have. Uh, and uh, I would watch that movie together with them, bring some other people, some pizza, Chinese food, whatever you want to bring, make it fun. Once they see that movie, they'll have some sense of inspiration. After that, they could uh, you know, send some in, uh, questions uh, to me and I'll do my best to answer. If you Obviously, if you have the answers, you can answer them yourself. But it's important for you not to water down Judaism, not to water down Judaism at all, even though it looks like society does that, and sometimes people in the rabbinical world do it in the name of uh, famous rabbis. One of the uh, most uh, 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 popular, uh, 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 I guess you should say, uh, um, sects of Judaism today that uh, unfortunately very often waters down uh, Judaism is Chabad. And, uh, and they say that this is really the way that... Uh, uh, this is really the way that you're supposed to teach, you know, darkeh, darkeh noam, everything is nice, uh, everything with pleasantness, and that's how the Rebbe did it, and it's really not true. Uh, it's not true, and I'll give you the proof of it. Um, in the, uh, the Rebbe is quoted in Likutei uh, Sichot, in the first volume, on page 98, and he says the following from this we learn a powerful lesson in our daily lives that when attempting to draw others closer to Judaism this is the Lubavitch Rebbe speaking not me I'm just reading it when attempting to draw others closer to Judaism there is sometimes the temptation to be benevolent with matters of Jewish law and to compromise few halachic requirements in order to make Judaism a more attractive product nevertheless we can learn from the cases of Yosef and Moshe that such benevolence will ultimately prove counterproductive since it's not based on a directive from God, meaning Jewish law. Even if one will indeed attract more people by dispensing with a few precepts, one is effectively trying to extinguish a fire with kerosene. For by offering sanctions and compromises, one will only serve to reinforce the opposition to true Torah Judaism, as Yosef strengthened Egypt. So here the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Alava Shalom, says that to water down Judaism is not the way to do Kiruv. It's quite the opposite. You have to tell people the truth. There's a reward for good deeds. There is a punishment for bad deeds. And uh, those of you that teach your family, your friends, uh, strangers, that way, you're doing good. If you teach it any other way, you're not doing good. 
And if your rabbi says, no, no, this is the way of today, and uh, they come from Chabad, tell them, listen, uh, you should listen to Lubavitcher Rebbe. He didn't do it that way. He did it the way Rabbi Reuben does it. He did it the way that the rest of the sages do it. He did it the way that all the successful people in the Kiruv world throughout all of history did it, which is tell people the truth, not a watered-down version of it. Next question. Hi, Rabbi. Why does God give infinite punishment? What purpose does it serve? And why did God create such a big universe with only a tiny portion of it with life? Well, there's a lot of questions. Uh, Well, the reasons of why God does what he does are unknown to us lowly humans. We have what's called ta'amim, meaning a little taste of certain things, a little understanding of certain things, but the reasons of of why he does what he does, in order to understand him, you have to be him. Uh, you're talking about, you know, this is a divine creator. We are a finite creation. So we are literally a nothing, and he is everything. Enod mil But, you know, just to understand, I guess, God has doesn't have a concept of a before him uh, or after him. The past, the present, and the future are all the same to him. To us, the past is behind us. The future is the possibilities of the future, and the present is what we live. So we think of of, of infinity as something unreachable, whereas to him, it's, it's it's the same thing as right now. So that's one. Second thing is is to remember that there are two aspect, two parts, if you will, of the soul. There is the, uh, I like to explain it this way, Uh, again, if you look at the Kabbalistic books, it's obviously much more complex, but as we learned earlier today, uh, you know, uh, to to put the Mishpatim, to teach it in an understandable way, that there are two parts of the soul. One of it is the divine part that Hashem put into Adam Alishon, that's part of all of us. It's not that Hashem has parts, but in essence, He put uh, uh, Himself into us, but we are not God. So there is something else also that he put there that's not him. So that's the, let's call it, that's the you. That's the me. Okay, so there is the one that gives us the life, which is Hashem. And then there is the me and the you and everybody else that's there. So when somebody sins, the uh, irreparable sins, without doing tshuva, when they desecrate Shabbat, and uh, they die as a uh, Shabbat desecrator, then their punishment is forever. If they waste seed and they don't do tshuva, then their punishment is forever. If they commit adultery and uh, they, uh, they don't do tshuva, then their punishment is forever, and so on and so forth. There are certain sins that are forever. There are many other sins. Most sins are not punished forever. Most sins are punished for a temporary amount of time. It could be a lot of time, it could be many years, but it's not forever. So, now, the part of forever to us relatively speaking it's forever to Hashem it's not forever why because eventually even what's considered to us as forever literally let's say millions of years from now to him it's like tomorrow it's the same thing as today or to, you know so so because eventually you're gonna have this world then you have Mashiach then you have a thousand more years in this physical world then there is the spiritual world of uh, Olam Abba, and there's another part after that, and then eventually it, there's a, you know, this world is destroyed. Uh, so the point is that there's certain people that's going to go to this Olam Abba uh, on, a, on, on the physical part and then the spiritual part, um, but the, uh, that particular soul that is horrible and, and did things that are irreparable uh, will eventually be destroyed. Now, you say, okay, so why punish it for so long, let's just call it a million years, if you're going to destroy it anyway? Because if God created it, and this thing has already existed, uh, you know, for so many thousands of years, reincarnated over and over again, obviously this is not just something that is a, uh, uh, you know, it's not a, you know, garbage that you can just throw in the garbage and it just goes away because the, you know, delivery, you know, the garbage guys collect it and it goes to the sanitation department. This soul is, is in essence, a, uh, a divine creation. It's not something that uh, Hashem just destroys in a second. It has to go through 
a process of destruction in order to separate it from the divine part of God. And that, in essence, takes a uh, extraordinary amount of time and pain and so on. So eventually it will be destroyed. Uh, but it's, again, in accordance to our uh, uh, perception of time, it's forever. Now, as far as uh, such a big universe with only a tiny portion of it being with life, that's not necessarily uh, the case. Uh, first off, uh, although the Torah doesn't talk about uh, other uh, civilizations and other planets because uh, they, they don't affect our life, uh, it doesn't negate the fact that there could be possibly uh, of other creatures and other places, uh, you know, a planet of cockroaches or something. I don't know. Like there could be something uh, in other places, but again, it's never going to be like a, you know, uh, an Independence Day film type of scene where a bunch of aliens show up with UFOs shooting down buildings and wanting to take over the resources of the that that stuff. That's only in movies. So there could be life in other places. The Torah doesn't uh, negate it, uh, but that life doesn't affect us. The other thing is also is that the universe itself is uh, structured in such a fashion that it is a uh, a representation uh, of of uh, in essence of trying to be uh, the uh, how great he is. Meaning, if you saw a table, okay, a table, then you know a simple table. You buy it at IKEA. I don't know, for $150. I don't know, with inflation, maybe it's $250. So you say, okay, whoever made that table is smart enough to make tables. Now, if you saw right next to it, there's another table, but that table has a bunch of electronics coming out of it. Uh, there's a screen. It's a touchpad. It has, uh, you know, a coffee machine in it. Then obviously you see that the guy who made that table is much more significant as far as his abilities than the first guy. Now, if you see the next table next to it, you see that, that table transforms into a car. Okay? We're going to live in a hypothetical imagination for now. Now, you guys obviously realize that the third guy that made that table is better than the first two. Now, if the fourth table turns into a rocket, obviously, that's he is even better. And the point being is that they greater the creation the more symbolic it is of who the creator is so as great as god is he had to create the world in such a fashion where we would be able to identify his greatness through his creation and that's why anyone that watched the movie that we made called the signature of god and saw some of the details of creation of how the name of god is in different parts all of creation and uh, also literally thought about the different parts of creation that I mentioned in that film, it makes you realize how great God is to a certain extent. Again, we would never uh, uh, conceptualize how great he is. He's too big for us to realize how great he is. But the more a person uh, learns about the creation, the more they'll understand how great its creator is. And also remember that this creation is not made the way that it is, as great as it is, as big as it is, with no purpose. Every, one of the greatnesses of the, of the creator is that this creation was with a purpose. Meaning that every single part of the creation has a purpose that the world could not live without at that time. For example... The, uh, if a person looks for the first time at the solar system and you see the, uh, you know, the, the globe, you see the earth, unless you're one of these crazy people that think that we live on, you know, in a desert, like a flat uh, earth. So you see the earth and you see this globe, this sphere, and then you see that there's a bunch of other spheres and, uh, you know, other planets and stars and so on. Now, you know, listen, if there's no life over there or if there is life that's not going to affect us, why have all of those? Why have all of this? Well, if you look, if you study a little bit of science, you'll know that the earth could not be anywhere else in the solar system and still support life 
And I don't mean couldn't be anywhere else, like it couldn't be in a different Milky Way or maybe, I don't know, uh, you know, a few hundred uh, uh, million light years away. No, no, no. I mean, literally, a degree to the right, a degree to the left, you know, uh, would, would simply uh, not support life here. If we're one uh, uh, step closer to the sun, we'd uh, dry up and die. One step further, we'd freeze to death. Uh, anywhere else in the solar system would be too far, too close to the sun or the moon. Or, uh, and also, for the Earth to do what it does as far as the spinning and everything else, it also has to depend on the gravitational pull of the other things that are around it that themselves are depending on the things that are around it, meaning that the other planets and stars and everything else, they're not just there for the movies to have them and just simply for you know, a nice look like a painting. They're all there. They're all being used in order to support the Earth that the people of Israel are on. Everything is, that, is, is created for that to exist. For that to exist. So Earth can only exist here, but it needs to have the sun in a certain distance from where it is. I think it's like 90 million light years away uh, or somewhere around that number. You have to have the moon this far. It couldn't be further. It couldn't be closer. The, uh, the other planets have to be that far from it. It couldn't be closer. It couldn't be further. It couldn't be different planets. Like if Pluto replaced Mars or something, that couldn't be because the gravitational pull would change, which would actually destroy our planet. And the point being is, is that everything is exactly where it needs to be in order to support life here. Uh, and if it wasn't here, if it wasn't that way, life would cease to exist. Now, again, you would go back to the original question. Why have all of it if he's the master of all, creator of all? Just create a world where you don't need all of that. Where you just have one little globe and that's it. Uh, just one neighborhood. That's the point. His greatness requires for him to make such a great planet because in order for us to see his greatness, we could simply look at his creation. And you could see that there is a world around our world and then there's also a world inside our world. If anybody learns the, uh, the different uh, uh, details about the atmosphere, learn in fact about the clouds, clouds and how they're made up and how you have uh, different gases coming from volcanoes, different gases coming from the, uh, uh, the evaporation of water. Uh, now, how do these things eventually become a cloud? Uh, you know, I mean, I, my whole life I thought, oh, this cloud is, I don't know, apparently it's a, uh, uh, some uh, uh, condensed air and, uh, you know, it's a, uh, maybe some water goes into it. No, no. The way it actually starts is unbelievable. Is a tiny little seed, tiny little, tiny, small, tiny seed that's floating in the air somewhere. And then eventually the water goes into it and starts blowing it up, blowing it up, blowing it up, and eventually it becomes this huge, gigantic cloud. Now, again, I know this sounds crazy, but go check it out. Check out, go on. I'm sure there's YouTube videos about it and there's endless books about it. How are clouds made? When you learn about how clouds are made, literally, you're like, wow, this is unbelievable. It's, you know, there's a, there's a seed floating in the air and water goes into this seed and somehow it becomes this magical little marshmallow traveling all over the place and in fact Hashem takes uses these clouds as a water transportation system to take let's say water from here in Florida he takes the seed that's traveling in the air then the uh, water from different gases and different places comes up fills up this cloud from water from Florida and then the cloud floats up in the air and goes to let's say Georgia or goes to New York or goes somewhere else. Why? Because Hashem wanted to transfer some of the water from here to Florida, to a, to a different state, to a different part of the world. And in essence, Hashem has a train system, a train system for, that transports water. There is no greater system in the world. Uh, there is a um, uh, amazing stuff that's uh, written about the stuff. And actually, you don't have to go to uh, the, uh, the heretic uh, scientists that uh, are atheists to learn this stuff. There are Jewish books uh, uh, that teach you about the uh, science from a uh, scientific perspective that's not anti-God. Uh, and it shows you all of these things, wonderful, wonderful things. So the point is that well, the more a person learns about the details of the creation, 
the more he realizes how great the creator is why shouldn't i serve such a great creator that literally every little thing has an endless amount of thought in it if i remember in the uh uh, book uh, Science Comes of Age, uh, which is also called The Coming Revolution by uh, Rabbi Zamir Cohen, uh, that uh, talks about a uh, the greatest camera system in the world that has a lens that adjusts automatically, a the greatest lens that ever existed, a lens that cleans it, cleans itself constantly, any it, and also has a defense mechanism to protect itself from anything that would uh, scratch it or hurt it, and repair system. In so many words, he's giving you the uh, the eye, uh, what the eye is. If a person learns uh, just literally just enough about the makeup of the eye, that in itself is uh, can consume an entire life and make you more enamored about how amazing the Creator is than anything else you could imagine. And that's the point of of how uh, you know why Hashem made the world so uh, extraordinary. Because the more you learn about this extraordinary creation, the more you realize that this creation could not have come from some explosion or some accident, uh, some big bang, or whatever other type of uh, strange uh, convoluted argument people like to have just to justify their sins and their their, uh, uh, lusts. Uh, Obviously, this this perfect creation had to be made by a perfect creator. Uh, and uh, those uh, that think, oh no, it's not perfect because people get sick, it's not perfect because people suffer, no, no, that's actually part of the perfection. It's just that you only see one side of the wall, whereas God sees the entire picture. Uh, Next, Golov, is it true that the ancient cities of refuge now correspond to occupied areas in Jordan and uh, Egyptian uh, and Palestinians, uh, if, if not, yes, so yes, there are uh, there are six cities of refuge and forty two cities of the Levi tribe that were given to them by the other tribes that were used as the cities of refuge anytime somebody accidentally murdered somebody and there was a uh, witness uh, and uh, they were allowed to go and run away to protect their life to these cities of refuge and yes, there are parts of biblical Israel that's in uh, in uh, those countries. Yes. If someone is in the process of conversion, but they have non-Jewish kids from a previous relationship, should they totally abandon the kids or keep in contact with them and pay child support? Uh, A person must, must fulfill their obligations uh, for children that they they brought into the world. Uh, Just because you chose to, uh, uh, you know, be a, a servant of God does not give you a permission to abandon responsibilities. You have to, you had kids, you brought kids to the world, you have to pay child support if that's uh, it was necessary for you. You have to comply with not just the law of the land, uh, but also you have to uh, be an ethical person. To punish your kids because you decide to become Jewish is going to desecrate God's name. Just like a person that stole money when he was not Jewish uh, and, and then converted, even though technically their soul is a brand new soul, they still have to return that money that they uh, stole uh, when they were a Gentile, because uh, if they don't, then the, you know, the Gentiles will look at you and say, look, this guy is a uh, thief. Jewish people are thieves. And in essence, you're going to desecrate God's name. So certainly a person that had children from the previous, uh, you know, from before he converted should not uh, uh, abandon their responsibilities. Uh, they should pay child support, take care of whatever they need to take care of as far as financially. In regards to the relationship that you have with them, sure, you should have some type of relationship with them. You're still their father or mother or whatever you are. Uh, you know, you still, uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, uh, so long as they don't try to uh, entice you to abandon God and, uh, and, and uh, you know, serve some type of idol, certainly you should maintain the relationship and, and, and be a good leader, be a good parent. Uh, and uh, be supportive and try to encourage them to be decent people. You don't have to be Jewish to be a decent human being. And in fact, if you abandon those responsibilities and abandon them, what's going to end up happening is that that's going to come back to hunt you, uh, where those kids are going to grow up and they're going to hate all of Jews and uh, and God himself because you're going to be their version of Judaism. So in essence... 
the, uh, the abandoning that uh, those relationships because of Judaism is the wrong way to do things. It's irresponsible. It's unethical, and needless to say, it's not what uh, what God wants. Now, again, sometimes the the kids are older. You know, they're uh, they're already married. Uh, they're already married. They already have uh, lived their life, and you simply don't have a good relationship with them. If they're married, they're you know they have a different way of life and so on. Then it's uh, it's different. But if they're still children. You know, they're still like, in, uh, you know, young uh, uh, kids and teenagers and they still need, uh, you know, that uh, love and support from their parents. Certainly, you should, uh, you should be there for them uh, one way or the other. Uh, there's no reason for you to abandon them. It's not their fault that you couldn't get along with their, uh, you know, with their uh, other parent, uh, nor that you chose to uh, uh, become uh, a Jew. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not, uh, that's... It's not necessary for you to to abandon them. It's not. Uh, it's not right. Uh, do people get any reward for good things they do as part of a false religion? For example, Christians that fight against abortion and homosexuality, or Muslim women dressing modestly. Uh, yes, uh, people that do good things get rewarded for the good things that they do. Um, you know, it's again there people that are. Uh, dressing modestly in Islam, they're not dressing immodestly for the sake of some idol. They're dressing immodest, they're, they're dressing modestly because that's part of their culture, uh, and, and certainly part of their beliefs. But it's not because of some idol or something like that. So Islam, uh, whatever good they do, they it gives them a reward. In fact, one of the reasons why they have uh, the blessings that they do, uh, as far as uh, the the monetary success and uh, and so on, is because of their women's modesty. At least, uh, some of them. Uh, as far as the uh, you know Christians or other Gentiles that uh, you know support the poor and uh, fight against uh, homosexuality and abortion and so on, they're not necessarily doing it in the name of their idol. They're doing it because they're, it's it's their beliefs that these things are wrong. Even though again it's part of their religion to uh, to um, not believe in these things and not support these things. The fight against it is not a part of their religion. Uh, so they're doing it because it's the right thing to do, and certainly they'll get rewarded for it. Uh, but if they die as an idol worshiper, that whatever reward they're going to get, they're going to get in this world. Uh, so usually people that are good have uh, you know uh, other options that Hashem gives them during their life at some point to abandon the things that are ruining that good. Well, I was reading about uh, Tchum boundaries in Masechet Beitzah, but don't understand how it works in the modern city where towns all blend in each uh, each other. Uh, what constitutes a boundary at Tchum where to begin? Uh, so, I mean, as far as, you know, for for, for, for the sake of uh, Eruv and things of that nature, um, you know, the Jewish communities typically have a Eruv. If the Jewish community does not have any roof, uh, then uh, you know, then, then you obviously can't really do much uh, as far as outside. You can't uh, carry anything outside. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, aside from walking, you, know, you can't really do much. And uh, it's two uh, thousand amot from your house. Uh, but uh, if if there if you don't live in a place where there's any roof, uh, then it makes things a little different, a little difficult. Um, but uh, remember that an eruv doesn't necessarily always have to be made by uh, the rabbi. An eruv could be is a wall. Uh, so uh, it's a uh, if you're let's say in a uh, gated community that's surrounded by a wall, uh, that's an eruv. That's an eruv. Uh, but uh, point being is is that if you know if you have a eruv in your community, then that means that you can carry things on Shabbat. If let's say you're walking to shul and you need to carry your talit and uh, books and things like that, then you don't have a problem. But if you don't have an eruv, then leave those things in the shul and don't carry anything on Shabbat. As far as details of uh, uh, dealing with that whole tchum and everything else, uh, you don't need to deal with it today because again, Jewish communities typically have that eruv and you don't uh, have to deal with the tchum. A whole part of counting 2,000 amot. Uh, Shalom, love. Uh, I'm 29 years old. No hide from Canada looking for a wife for years. Okay. I've given lots of tzedakah to Kiev, do chesed, try to do tshuva. 
What else can I do to merit a wife? The loneliness is terrible. Uh, it seems just to get worse. Well, I mean, I, I don't know what, um, uh, how long you've been doing it and uh, what else you're doing, but I could tell you that everything happens in its time. If, if it was the right time for Hashem to give you the right zivug, then you would have gotten it. So apparently it obviously shows that it's not hasn't been the right time. That doesn't mean that's not going to be the right time forever, uh, but uh, you have to do whatever you can to do as much or more than what you've done. Don't count your chickens. Don't count all the good things that you've done in the past. What you've done in the past was for you. You did kiruv and chesed and tshuva and learn and all those things that you did for your own sake. You didn't do it for God. God doesn't benefit from any of that. You're doing it for yourself. You're benefiting from it. Uh, it could have even uh, given yourself more life as a result of it. It could have been a decree that you were supposed to die or get sick or lose money or do a lot of things. But instead, Hashem changed the decree and uh, because of the good things that you're doing. So never underestimate the value of the good that you've done, even though you didn't get one of the things you wanted to get. Uh, but all the good that you do, you're doing it for yourself. That's number one. Number two, uh, you know, it's everything uh, that... Uh, is, uh, that Hashem wants to give you, He will give you in a time that is uh, uh, you need to get it. Now, does that mean that that makes it easy? No, it's it's difficult. But you have to know that your faith in Hashem has to keep you strong. Your faith in Hashem has to keep you strong to know that Hashem is giving you exactly what you need. Apparently, right now you need the test to overcome your uh, 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 any type of obstacles, any lackings in, in, in faith in Hashem, any lacking in belief in Hashem, any uh, uh, lackings in commitment to Hashem, uh, and Hashem is testing you to see uh, if you'll pass the test. But how long the test is going to be? Different people, different things. But certainly, uh, this should not discourage you from doing uh, as much or more uh, than what you've already done. I generally always recommend for people to do more than what they've done because typically people uh, don't do as much as they can do. Uh, so always push for more, always grow, and Bezal Hashem, you'll succeed. Uh, in regards to the difficulty in the test, yes, we all have tests. We all have tests, but uh, the Gemara in Masechet Moed Katan uh, has a story where a, uh, one of the Chachamim walks into a uh, synagogue and he sees one of the young guys uh, crying hysterical and he asks him why are you crying he says oh rabbi i want to you know marry this girl and and, and she doesn't want to and uh I, i'm just crying i want i want to marry her and the rabbi says well, marry somebody else what's the big deal why do you have to marry only her she doesn't want to. she doesn't want to no no it has to be her it has to be her it has to be her and the rabbi told him listen don't pray for hashem to just give you her pray for hashem to give you a zivug it's not good for you to pray for Hashem to give you that. Maybe it's not good. Maybe she's not good for you. No, no, Rabbi, I know she's good for me. I know she's good for me. And uh, he didn't listen to the Rabbi. Anyway, some uh, time passed, maybe a year or two passed, and the rabbi, same Rabbi came back to that congregation, and he sees the same guy crying hysterical. And he says, wow, you're still crying over the same girl to marry you? He goes, no, no, Rabbi, no, no, I'm crying about something else. No, well, what are you crying about? Uh, I'm crying about the fact that I, I wanted to leave me. You know, I, I married her, and uh, you know, it's, and, and I can't stand her. I hate her. She's the worst thing in the world. And, and the sages teach from there that from there we learn we don't ask Hashem for specific blessings. We ask Him for blessing. Don't ask Hashem for a specific girl or a specific guy or a specific amount of money. Uh, ask Hashem to help you. Help me with such and such. Help me with my, uh, you know, getting married. Help me with my, uh, you know, panasa. Help me with my job. Help me with my learning. General stuff. Don't give Hashem specific details because many times what we ask for when we're specific is not good for us. It's not good for us. So ask Hashem for blessings and as not Hashem, you'll get them. Especially if you continue doing as much or more good than what you've already done. Uh, next, I was listening to the previous lecture. I come late. My question will be, if 99% of souls are reincarnations and we are living in this kind of environment, is it not automatically that 1% pure souls or new souls will suffer of the environment and something is wrong with the acoustic? I'm not going to say. 
if you're talking about the, the, the brand new souls that come to the world, are they going to suffer from this environment? No, I mean, listen, every generation had its difficulties. You know, I know that people believe that this is the worst generation of all. It's the only generation such and such happened. But if, the more you read Torah and you read what happened at the time of the previous generations, the more you see that there's nothing new under the sun, just like Shlomo Amelech says. You know, the, uh, the uh, horrible things that exist in society today existed back then. Uh, you know, pornography is not a new thing. Homosexuality is not a new thing. Pedophilia is not a new thing. Uh, you know, the uh, cheating, lying, stealing, murder, uh, corruption, none of that stuff is, is new. Everything that's in the world today was in the world back then. Even cross-dressing and, tra and, and transvestites, it's not a new thing. There's uh, uh, Rabbi Akiva Iger writes about it, and there's uh, some other Rishonim from 900 years ago write about people from those times that uh, used to do that stuff. Uh, you know, so, I mean, it's a, uh, nothing is new. Nothing is new. The test that we have today, uh, we had back then. Perhaps we didn't have the same technology that we have uh, today, uh, back then, but to, to do the same things was still possible just using different things, different tools. Uh, it's hard to understand Leah's attitude towards her sister Rachel when Leah accused her of trying to steal her husband. After Rachel sacrificed for her position for Leah. Okay. Did she lose out from her kindness? No. Leah didn't. Uh, Leah was righteous and, and Rachel was righteous. Uh, just that Leah did not uh, know the magnitude of the uh, 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 test that Rachel had to go through and the magnitude of the gift that she gave her. Uh, because, you know, the Rachel and the rest of the sages and, and, and Tzadikim didn't go out into the world and say, listen, I just saved you, I just did this for you, I did this, I did this. Many times they did a lot of their chesed, a lot of their kindness in hiding where the other person wouldn't even know, wouldn't even know uh, what they did. And this is actually the way of Tzadikim, is to never publicize the good that they do and... Um, and uh, really uh, try hard to uh, to hide it, hide it as much as possible. So it's a uh, it's certainly uh, uh, likely that uh, Leah had no idea what Rachel did in order to uh, to make sure that Leah is actually the wife and uh, and uh, that the things are what they are. Uh, and and Leah was uh, acting, uh, you know, uh, in accordance to what she was supposed to act. She didn't do if she didn't care then she wouldn't love her husband. She had to care that uh, Rachel uh, wants the husband and so on. So it's not, uh, there was nothing uh, wrong with that. Okay. Okay, Kodav, I have heard that the Star of David originally is not a Jewish symbol. Rather, it's a penetrated Judaism at some point. Is it true uh, by the Holy Torah? Uh, there's no source for the uh, Star of David looking the way it does according to, according to the Torah. Meaning, you're not going to find a place in the Torah that, that uh, describes the Star of David as two triangles or anything like that. No, it doesn't have a source in the Torah that I'm familiar with. There are certain Chachamim that have found different things in it that are connected to it, uh, connecting to the teachings of the Torah, such as all of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet you can find inside the, uh, uh, the Star of David and other interesting things, but it doesn't have a source in the Torah, uh, per se, no. Uh, Hashem bless you, thank you very much. Amen. We're giving people the benefit of the doubt. What are the ways you can be sure it's not an improper place of kindness? Improper place kindness. When should you hold back? Uh, okay, so it all depends on what you're doing. In, in regards in regards to being kind to people, uh, first and foremost, you should know that to be kind, uh, you cannot be at the same level of kindness to everybody. If the person is 
a Talmud Chacham, a Torah scholar, a righteous Jew uh, that learns Torah, then that is the top of the echelon. That's the one that you are to be as kind as possible with. Uh, if the person is a uh, uh, not a Torah scholar, uh, then obviously the kindness needs to be much lower. Uh, this doesn't mean you don't need to be kind. It's just you don't need to be as kind because again, the person that's not Torah that's not a Torah scholar, there's less to uh, believe, uh, you know, because it's. He doesn't have the same commitment to the laws of the Torah, so it is much more likely that he is a liar, a fraud, and so on. Uh, and if the if the person is not uh, religious at all, uh, then certainly the, it continues getting lower. Again, this doesn't mean that you are nasty to people that are not religious or nasty to non-Jews or anything like that. It just means that you cannot just simply believe somebody is uh, good just because uh, they look Jewish or because they are Jewish or you can't. Don't be a sucker. Don't be a fool. In fact, there's a guy that talks about how there was a certain guy that looked very, very religious that was uh, coming to the community to collect money. And uh, a couple of the sages suspected him that, uh, you know, he could be that this guy is a fraud. Uh, so they followed him. You know, he was coming all the time. They followed him. And they followed him and followed him. And uh, eventually they saw that he actually goes to a, uh, after a long journey, he goes to a uh, place and he has a very fancy house and he changes his clothes to beautiful clothes. And really the whole thing is a scam. This is just the way he pretends to be poor. And he, uh, uh, and he gets a lot of money from people and that's how he supports himself. That's his job, which unfortunately is very common in the world today. People pretend to be poor. They even have entire outfits. They even fake uh, being sick and so on. Uh, so the sages, you know, walked in on him and saw, oh, you're a fraud, but Baruch Hashem that you exist. They said, why Baruch Hashem that I exist? Why thank God that I exist? They said, because if people like you, frauds, didn't exist, and all of the people that are collecting charity were actually righteous, then that means that each time somebody would not give charity to somebody that would ask, they would get punished. So because there are people like you in the world that are frauds, that gives us the benefit of the doubt in, in, in heaven where it can always be assumed that we didn't give to such and such person because there's a possibility that that person's a fraud. So therefore, we don't have to give to everybody. So that's the thing. There's a benefit to the world to have frauds. Uh, that doesn't mean that you need to fall for it. That doesn't mean that you need to be an idiot and, and give to anybody that asks you. Point being is, is that there is a benefit even to the bad. It's all part of this perfect system that Hashem has. But still, I always tell people, if you're going to give charity, the number one place to give charity is to support Torah and to help people do tshuva. Q. That's the number one place, not according to me, according to the sages. So much so that the Gemara says in multiple places, when you help another person, do tshuva, not only are you considered a partner with the Creator, but even more so than anything else, every single mitzvah that that person ever does, and his kids ever do, and his descendants ever do, all of it goes to your account, so much so that even your greatest mitzvah that you will do on your own will, pale, will be compared as if it's nothing in comparison to a mitzvah that he does on your behalf, that goes into your account. So helping somebody do tshuva is by far the most profitable thing that uh, a person can do. Uh, and if a person has money, has the means, that obviously they should invest it in the most profitable place, not in the most so socially acceptable place, not in the most popular place. That's number one. Number two, if you, so if you're going to give the bulk of your money, the big things should go towards the thing that's the most profitable for you eternally and also the most profitable for society, which is also the more people do tshuva, the more it bet betters society because more people are Torah observant, follow the laws of God, that means going to be less crime, less criminals, less bad people. That's good for the world. Now, if it's somebody that you don't know, if it's a homeless guy, if it's a guy that's in dire straits having a tough time, if it's some strange woman that came to the neighborhood or it's uh, whatever, somebody you don't really know, if they are a Torah scholar, then you can give them something. But uh, again, I, uh, I would... Uh, uh, try to verify that they really are what they are, uh, especially if you're going to give a lot of money. If you're going to give a small amount of money, $5, 10 $20, you don't need to investigate anything. Just give them the money. 
But if you're going to give a lot of money, 100 bucks, 200 bucks, 500 dollars, you should do a little bit of double checking, especially if it's even more than that. Uh, but if it's just somebody that is uh, just a person that's down on their luck and so on, uh, I, I, I personally wouldn't recommend to give very much. Five dollars, ten dollars, small amount of money that's completely insignificant. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one reason is because uh, it's not profitable for you and it's not profitable for society for you to put the bulk of your money into such people. Uh, you want to put your money into people that are learning more Torah and bringing more good to the world, not people that are uh, usually a uh, detriment to themselves and detriment to the world. That's number one. Number two, those types of people, uh, typically, they're there for a reason. They're down on their luck for a reason. And uh, if you support them, you're actually not helping them, but rather you're enabling them where they could find, especially in today's world of, of, of technology, of WhatsApp and so on, uh, we've had people infiltrate our WhatsApp groups and Facebook groups and all types of things, look at phone numbers and emails and all types of things and just start calling people saying, listen, I'm Rabbi Rubin's student, you know, can you help me out? Even some people claim that they were uh, collecting on my behalf. We have some thieves like that that claim that they are collecting on our behalf. Obviously, they're not. Anyone that ever tells you they're collecting on my behalf, they're a liar. All the times that uh, you would ever donate, donate on our website or send us a check. Don't ever give it to any person. Don't ever give it to any person's personal bank account. Not, I will never have a representative that is going to collect money for me. So just going to let you know. Uh, I've been around for too long uh, to know that that's just simply a dumb idea. But anyway, there are people like that. that they are... Um, they're criminals. This is just what it is. So, and by you helping them, you're enabling them to continue because today they could simply go and join 50 groups and, you know, each group will have 100 people, you know, spend their afternoon messaging every single person, feeling bad, sending a picture with boo-hoo, boo-hoo, and, uh, you know, somebody's going to have some soft heart, send them 20 bucks. They do this 10 times a day. They're making a couple hundred dollars a day. They do this, uh, uh, you know, 20 times a day. They're making more money than you. Uh, and unfortunately, I've met quite a few of those people. I've even had the same guy, not realize it's me that he's contacting. I think I had a couple of numbers or whatever. Same exact guy contacted me as a rabbi and contacted me as a, pretty much as a, you know, somebody that's trying to get money from. One hand, he's co contacted me saying, uh, listen, uh, you know, I'm down. I have tough times. We need to pay our rent. I got my wife and my kid. We need to come up with uh, this money and ta da 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 and boo-hoo and boo-ha. And, you know, listen, I, sorry, it's, I don't know you and uh, I would have to do some investigation before I do anything. No, but can't you just do something? You know, all that stuff. Right. I know it sounds like I'm mean, but I've been around for a long time. I can tell you that it's, it's, uh, what I'm doing is right. Uh, if you want to give $5, $10, give it to whoever you want. But we're talking about substantial money. That's, 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 a, again, obviously everything is proportional for people. So this guy was asking, I think for like $1,700 or something like that. And, uh, you know, crying, crying, poor victim, whatever. Fine. Then I think it was literally like a day, two, three days later, he contacts me as a rabbi. And he's like, Hey rabbi, listen, I need some investment advice because I just sold my stocks and I need to make some purchases. And, and he doesn't realize that I, like, wait, you just cried poor to me as part of being the WhatsApp group. So you are simply collecting a couple, and you want to collect a few hundred dollars from me. Now you're coming to me asking for financial advice to manage your portfolio. And guess what? The same moron did this like at least a half a dozen times with me. You would literally contact me at one end, asking for money, boo-hoo, boo-hoo. And then another end, you know, telling me that he's like selling some property or selling some car or, you know, like it's just, it was mind boggling. And unfortunately, it's not the only story. Uh, I told you guys, if I, if I told all the stories that I deal with every single week, literally, I would have a book from here until next year uh, of material. Like, just, just, I tell you, if I tell you guys to invest in Kiruv, it's not because it's not going to my pocket. It's for your benefit. If you want to help poor people, we help poor people as part of our organization. We help poor people that we know 
they're poor but they're also Torah scholars so they're not cheating us a few times we caught some people that we realized that they, they didn't they weren't necessarily millionaires or anything like that but they didn't need as much as we thought they needed and no problem we fixed it but certainly we are not uh you know we're, we're, we're not stingy every dollar that comes in we send out we give to people non-stop a lot more than what people give us uh we give to others and uh, I help people literally every every ounce of my energy is, is to, for the help of society and I can tell you from experience people that contact you unsolicited tell you that they're down on their luck and they just need this extra 200 this extra 100 this extra 500 don't do it unless you got it like that unless you have so much money you don't know what to do with and you're bored with your life and you just want to send money to a bunch of people that are you know making money off of whatsapp groups and Facebook groups by all means do what you want but if you're investing for your eternity I would simply uh block those numbers and uh and not talk to them again don't become their friend don't become nothing they're most of the time they're criminals most of the time I, I I grew up in New York I was there for most of my life uh I've been around a lot of different people a lot of different money a lot of different uh, things in my life if I'm telling you this I'm telling you this from experience it's not because I mean I promise you I, I help uh, strangers every day every day it's, it's in, in, with money with help with everything else but it's it's I'm telling you it's a uh the scams that are happening today you don't even need to do the scam of Nigerian money anymore all you got to do is just join a bunch of religious groups or all the types of groups and just simply contact people telling them that you're down on your luck and you just need another hundred dollars if you do it enough you have enough uh, uh phones literally you can collect thousands of dollars every day so it's, it's it's because people naturally they're not it's not because they're merciful people want to make themselves feel good so he figures listen I make 500 bucks a day this guy doesn't have anything according to what he says so let me give this guy 100 bucks let me give this guy 200 let me you know what let me give this guy the entire 500 dollars that I made today why because tomorrow I'm going back to work and you know I'll make another 500 dollars it'll make me feel good and people will try to make themselves feel good by giving it to a bunch of strangers you're wasting your blessing Hashem gives you a blessing you're giving it to these people you're not doing good but again if it's insignificant amount of money five dollars ten dollars whatever small amount of money money that you would give a homeless guy by all means give it you don't need to care what he does with it but if it's more than that if it's uh, substantial to you do not give it's simply the wrong idea especially when these people have the nerve to contact you with their fairy tale story but they don't have the nerve to go get a job they don't have the nerve to to, to go and uh, get themselves together I know some guys that are, that are tough that are my students that are having a tough time and are struggling and guess what if they're really my students they're sucking it up I got some students that are living in a car I got some students that are living in uh, tough uh, you know places and so on but guess what they're not asking anybody for any handouts or any uh, listen poor me they're trying to get out of their hole they're trying to get out of their hole they're stand-up people and they're trying to get out of their hole so you know listen it's uh, if you got money you want to burn you just want to like you know throw it in the garbage you got plenty of people to give it to but as far as to give it to these people that contact you unsolicited and say poor me go get a job oh no I couldn't get a job I just got fired oh, okay so you know sorry I work and uh I rather use the money that I have to give it to people that I know are also going to work for me what do you mean work for you work for me eternally for, for when I go to heaven I'm not going to go heaven uh, to just give you money if I don't even know that you're, you're not even studying Torah now if you want me to give you five dollars I'll send you five dollars but usually they don't want five dollars they want 150 250 500 thousand they want big money because they got used to it don't do it don't do it it's not a uh it's not the uh it's not the right use of your money you want to do it anyway no problem it's, it's not a sin it's just not uh, I wouldn't do it and it's I don't think it's the right way to use the blessing Hashem gave you all right we're gonna uh well almost three hours okay another maybe one or two questions all right uh, my dear father is unable to say the morning blessings or make kiddush on his own due to his current medical condition I have been saying the blessings and kiddush and he says amen can he be covered with my blessings even though I'm a woman uh yes yes I mean if he has a uh, uh that that's his option that he has then certainly yes means he hears as if he's saying it so yes 
Uh, but if he can do it and he chooses not to, then it's not good. Then he needs to. But if, uh, from what you're saying, he can't do it. If he can't do it, then you do it for him. It's not a problem. You can say amen. Fantastic. Uh, does the firstborn son being presented to Hashem apply to all firstborn male creatures? No, Jewish people. Jewish people only. See, I recently read that the rabbi. Oh, last second. I'm sorry. This thing is dying. Battery. Phone is dying. Uh, what is this now? Ah, oh, here we go. I recently read that a rabbi said how Michal, the daughter of King Shaul, wrapped Philin in her day. Uh, this is mentioned in the Talmud without any protest from the rabbis. Uh, therefore, if a woman desires, she may wear tefillin. Is it true about Michal uh, wearing tefillin? How can the Torah observant Jews respond? Uh, yes, they, uh, there's no prohibition from the Torah for women to wear tefillin. Uh, if they know not only the laws of tefillin, but also the laws of purity, uh, in the previous generation, certain very, very righteous women like Michal, Buria, uh, some say the daughters of Rashi, used to put on tefillin. But since women today uh, do not know all of these details, and generally speaking, women that typically want to put on tefillin are usually heretics that are immodest. Uh, it is frowned upon for women to put on tefillin today, according to all opinions. Uh, if the, you know, women of the uh, previous generation some of them did it uh but again this is not to uh be replicated today uh because again women today are not anywhere near uh the level of the women of the previous generation not to disrespect the women of today it's just a reality same thing like men but for men it's an obligation for women it's not an obligation uh I uh, just heard that unfortunately someone from my extended family got engaged to a non-Jewish girl. Obviously, I can't say congratulations and will never attend the festivities. What should I do or say when I get a telephone call invite from this secular cousin? Uh, say to the secular cousin, uh, listen, I really want you to watch this movie. I'm going to send it to you right now. Uh, in fact, if he lives close enough, she lives close enough to you, invite them to your house and uh, show them Hashem took back his millions and let me know how they react. Uh, why do the sages from the past generation have nicknames like Chafetz Chaim or Chazal, uh, when Chazal says uh, prohibited to call another Jew name by names? Oh, no. uh, so the sages that have these names, that is the names of their books. Uh, so they're known by their, you know, many of the sages wrote many books, but then there is the, uh, the main book that represents them. Uh, so Ravavadya, for example, is Yabiya Omel. He has a series of books called Yabiya Omel. He also has others, but Yabiya Omel, that was like his, uh, the greatest work that he did. The Chafetz Chaim, his name was really Israel Meir, but he, he wrote the Chafetz Chaim. That was like his greatest, most recognized work, even though he wrote also the Mishnah Burah. Still, the Chafetz Chaim was uh, something out of this world. Uh, so uh, many of the uh, sages are called by their books, uh, about, about you know not uh, it's not some nobody makes that uh, name for them they in essence when you are uh, the uh, author of a very famous well-known work or you know something that's a uh, extraordinary work then usually you're called the uh, you know this is not just a uh, you know a uh, Joe S Smith this is the uh, uh, Joe the uh, writer of such and such so eventually you know they Nobody cares about the Joe. Why? Because they know this is the author of this extraordinary work that changed the lives of many. That's, that's how a person is known. It's a, it's a uh, way of honor. It's uh, honoring a person. It's not uh, the opposite. Uh, I know you're allowed to read Tehillim while you're in your Tefillin, but are you allowed to read Tikkun Klali since it might bring negative thoughts? Uh, Tikkun Klali is Tehillim. Is tehillim. Uh, so the Tikkun HaKlali is not different from any other Tehillim. You're allowed to hear, read it whenever you want. Uh, Hello, Rabbi Ken Wan, where 
or set the time of a self-winding watch on Shabbat? Does it make a difference if it was already working before? If self-winding, like you're talking about, like a Rolex or any of those watches, there's no problem of wearing them on uh, Shabbat. In fact, you could even wear a digital watch so long as you don't press the buttons and you're not, you know, it's not like one of those uh, smart watches that when you, uh, you know, put it on, you look at it, it starts turning on because of your move. If it's just the old time uh, types of digital watches uh, that, uh, you know, or, or a uh, self-winding watch, there's no problem with wearing it. Uh, it's not considered mukze. Uh, how do we know how big the bucket was? Uh, oh, you're talking about probably the bucket to, uh, for, the, for the camels? Uh, well, I, I would suggest going to one of two things. Either look online for uh, how, you know, how much do camels drink, or you can go to uh, the Middle East. Uh, I would recommend Israel. Go to the areas of Eilat. Uh, you know, and over there they have camels. There's Arabs usually over there with, with camels. They rent them out. Uh, or you can go to Morocco. And you can see after, you know, the, uh, the, the time comes when the camels uh, come to drink, you'll see that uh, one bucket is not even a fraction of the amount that the, uh, each camel will have to drink. So, I mean, if you're saying that uh, she had to bring, you know, five, six, seven buckets per camel, and these buckets are big, uh, then you're talking about 10 camels, uh, that's a lot of buckets. But if you're talking about, let's say, it had to be little cups, you know, that a little girl could wear, a little girl could, could, could hold, then she would pretty much have to bring the entire Walmart supply. Uh, so uh, I don't think that would be the case. All right, guys, thank you very much for learning with me. Hashem bless each and every single one of you. Uh, it's, a, it's been, uh, I think, an uh, extraordinary uh, shiul. Uh, oh, there's another question here. Rabbi, is it okay to have intermarriage ethically and religiously, and what are some of the restrictions of dating before marriage? Uh, no, intermarriage, if you're talking about different religions, Jews are not allowed to marry non-Jews. Uh, but if two people are Jews, uh, you know, they're allowed to marry each other, it doesn't make a difference if one is Ashkenazi and the other one is Sephardi, the one is, one is Yemenite, the other one is Ethiopian, or the other one is Sephardi, Ashkenazi, we're all allowed to marry each other, except the uh, Kohen is not allowed to marry a uh, divorcee or a uh, convert, but uh, as far as eth uh, uh, ethnicity, color, uh, traditions, all that stuff, we're all allowed to marry each other. That's among the Jews. As far as Gentiles, Gentiles are only allowed to marry Gentiles. And if a Jew marries a Gentile, they're both going to go to Gainom forever. So hopefully that will never happen again. Bacha, batzlacha, to every single person that supports us, watches us, and makes sure to share this with as many people as possible so other people could learn more about what Judaism really is according to the Torah and not according to the wicked people that try to uglify it. Uglify it according to serve their base, their their bias. Thank you very much for learning with me. Kol tuf.